Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can understand me all. Uh, the mic is on and uh, procedures are going forward. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you all to our event today here in our premises of Accountants Europe in the European uh, quarter of Brussels. Uh, a, very well wo uh, a very warm welcome uh, to our speakers, especially to our panelists, to the representatives uh, of our member bodies, and especially also to the staff. I hope you had a good travel to come here, and with that we will directly head into the program. Um, the importance of SMEs and the related work of Accounts Europe. Uh, I think it's very easy to understand the importance of uh, the SMEs for the economy in Europe. Just to mention some figures, we have about 23 million enterprises in Europe which are estimated to be SME, whatever that is. They employ 90 million of staff and they are uh, creating more than 55% of cross domestic product in the real world, not in the financial sector. But these are very impressive figures, and I think that is worthwhile that we care about SMEs. We as auditors, we have to care about SMEs. Coming from a medium-sized audit firm, I have years of experience with SME audits. I don't know how many audit reports I'm signing, and I have to say we are not so much uh, on, the, on the audit on the lower level, if it comes to the smaller SMEs, we are more on a review than on an audit. The point is uh, that we as auditors, we can add value to the SMEs itself, to the management of SMEs, by helping them to streamline uh, their financial pro pro process and to make sure that their financial statements are correct, which is not always the case, as we all know. At Accountants Europe, we are dedicated to help the SMEs, and if you look at the screen, you see a breakdown of our work which we are doing for SMEs. So we are not just caring about the top segment of the listed work, we are really dedicating a lot of work to the SME sector. Uh, here, this is just a breakdown of our 2017 works. Uh, you see the publications, the events, consultation responses. And what is very interesting is that one out of three members in our working group comes from an, a medium-sized practice, medium and small practice. I think that is uh, uh, worthwhile to mention. Uh, today, what are we doing today? We are uh, looking a little bit backwards because in our members' assembly in March 2017, we had the honor to have Arnold Skilder, the chair of IAASP, with us. He was speaking uh, on the development and IAASP initiatives uh, in the area of small entity audits. At that members' assembly, we also had our friend Per Hanstead from the Norwegian Institute, and Per was uh, making us uh, uh, acquainted to the standard SASE, a standard uh, specifically uh, uh, um, drafted for the audit of small entities. Uh, today we are happy to pick up uh, that work which we started in uh, March uh, last year. And uh, what was the outcome of that members' assembly? Well, we implemented a task force uh, for the SME audit. It's called SME Audit Task Force. It's composed uh, of experts in this field from various European countries, and some of the members of that task force are here in the room today. Thank you very much for showing up. The outcome of the work of that task force is that very nice uh, piece of papers. Nice for the colors, and I think nice for uh, the content. With this publication, Simplifying Auditing Standards for Small or Non-Complex Entities, we are trying to push forward the debate. This paper is one of our Cushito theories. Cushito is Latin. Those who were uh, at this education, it means I think. Uh, and uh, what does it mean, I think? Well, it's not a position. It is thought to be the presentation of our thought leadership work, and it's about to stimulate the debate. So if you read that paper, and we are going through that today, it's not final work, it's there, uh, yeah, to a little bit of stock taking, 
uh, if you look at that, and a little bit uh, outlook, what can we do? So that will be the basis of uh, today's work. Uh, what will, is the outline of uh, uh, the outlay of today's uh, uh, event? You see all the, the program, I can cut short for that. Our friend Miles Thompson, the chair of the Audit and Assurance Policy Group at the Council of Europe, will guide us uh, through the day. Miles sitting over there. Then uh, we start uh, with Hilde. Hilde will uh, bring us a little bit closer and make us familiar with the content of uh, this paper. After that, Arnold Skilde will present again the position and the work of the IAASB. Catherine Beckshaw uh, will join us via video conference, and that is why we have to be a little bit on time, uh, because that is related to uh, certain uh, telecom channels, etc. And after that, after Catherine, we will have four panelists. Thank you for joining us. They will discuss the broad picture of the paper and the discussion so far. Uh, well, I'm incredibly curious to see what will be the outcome of today. And uh, enough of the words, let's get started. Before we get started, I would like to say thank you uh, to many uh, colleagues and uh, people involved. Uh, for most, the members of our SME Audit Task Force who were drafting and working on these papers, the management of the quality team who reviewed the paper and in the end said, yes, that can go the uh, team here in Brussels of Accountancy Europe, and of course, you all, our stakeholders, our colleagues, and uh, representatives of member bodies, thank you for coming here, and I hope staying with us till the end of the day and the event. And with that, I can hand over to Hilde uh, uh, to guide us through that paper. Thank you very much for listening, and have a nice day. Thank you for coming again. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I, I think I will take the red chair. Looks very nice. So good afternoon from my side as well. As the president already said, I'm Hilde Blommer. I'm the deputy chair of Accountancy Europe. And one of my roles is uh, also to get involved with all the work we do on audit and assurance. So although it is really the team, I'm sorry, uh, Noemi, uh, Julia, and also uh, Mihai that have worked on this paper together with our communication team and obviously the members of the task force, uh, I uh, will try to get you a little bit into the paper that we have done. I am sure you have all seen it on your tables. I'm sure you have all read it before you came here. Uh, but nevertheless, it might be good to give you just a few highlights so that you're up to speed on uh, what we have uh, done so far. And here you see uh, the picture I have, not to uh, introduce that again. But as our president said, it is a Cogito paper, it's uh, including IDs, and it is meant to stimulate the debate, and that's very much what we look forward to do today, not only with the panelists and the speakers we have today, but also with you, so uh, you will have ample opportunity to actually participate in the debate. We will get to that uh, a little bit later into our event, so I would say get ready for that. So. You have seen the title of our paper, Simplifying Auditing Standards for Small or Non-Complex Entities. And uh, that is really the scope of our paper. We looked at uh, what does audit mean for small entities. And that is in Europe, because that's our European environment we talk to. That's based on the thresholds define, defined in, in, in national legislation. Uh, and uh, they uh, have some guidance from the European level, but it's on national level still that there is a, 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 a um, uh, determining of what is a small entity. But we didn't think we should stop there. We also thought, well, if we look at that, we should also look at what it is that you can do if you do an audit of a non-complex entity, because it might be similar, but it might also be different, and that's also the target, the scope of, of the work that we did, and what is a non-complex entity. It's would be based on the auditor's judgment that he would consider what is a complex entity, because if that's what we're looking for as far as the standards, obviously you have to know where it is that you would apply that. That's not 100% scientific, but that's a guide, that's a direction uh, we, we took in our paper. Um, 
As far as uh, the content of our uh, cogito paper, uh, we actually looked at uh, a number of things. Uh, our, um, I would say, our inspiration to look at it, our president has already explained it, but uh, very much it effectively started from the importance of small and medium-sized entities in the economic environment. Uh, they are the backbone of the European uh, economy. And then when we look at that from uh, what does this mean for us, for auditors, what is our role there, uh, we uh, very much believe that audit uh, ensures financial statements are reliable in st instilling trust in the economy and in, in its growth. Uh, that's not only for the large entities, but we believe that that is true throughout and also why then not only uh, for the large uh, entities, but also for, for smaller entities and for non-complex entities. So uh, that is uh, where we started from. And if you talk about an audit uh, in our profession, what does this mean? You think about how are we going uh, to deliver this uh, service, how are we going to do this audit? So for that, we, we say we need a benchmark. That's why we need standards. And then we very quickly get into what, what you do at the IWSB, Arnold. Uh, but when we started to look into that, uh, we came to see uh, what we called some conflicting pressures. And uh, we all know the ISAS, the International Standards on Auditing. And uh, when we looked at applying them in this SME environment, uh, those conflicting pressures that we saw was, uh, well, there has been a development of the regulatory environment, which has uh, led to having ISAs that are very de de detailed and very complex. And, and that leads to uh, quite complex standards. And there is the notionality, uh, the, the notion of proportionality and scalability. It's there for small and medium-sized entities, but it does not prove to be easy to apply in practice. We heard time and time again that, okay, it's there, but if you want to apply it, it seems to be difficult. So uh, that's, uh, I think, really why we decided to do uh, this, uh, this project, uh, because not in the least, uh, also, uh, we heard from difficulties that practitioners were in encountering uh, when they were applying uh, the uh, the ISAs and it went from uh, you know there is this uh, uh, incredible amount or a maze even of requirements and application material uh, uh, there is this uh, limited uh, uh, scope for scalability and proportionality in practice because there are uh, so uh, many uh, requirements that uh, see, still seem to have to be applied. There is quite uh, a driven uh, risk analysis. Uh, there is uh, quite some, some work to be done in internal control. So it's, it's difficult to do. Uh, and over time, uh, by, based on regulatory pressure, we have seen the standards being scaled up, maybe rather than being scaled down. And, and, and uh, last but not least, you know, some practitioners, they think uh, back about the good old days, I would say, and they found that then it was easier to have, uh, I would say, more value added within an audit, not really compliance driven, not uh, documentation driven for a regulator, but they could add more of their skills and, and that might, uh, you know, be perceived by uh, their client, by the SME, as, as giving more value because they might also, uh, in the meantime, have had some advice on, on company law or on, on some IT issues or on, on matters that uh, normally an auditor is cognizant about. And, and that seems to be lost a, a little bit. So uh, this is what was put to us. So we took this together. And so that's what made us uh, go into this uh, project. And then this is about difficulties, this is about issues, and we said, because you have seen on our paper, we have a secondary title, Exploring Possible Solutions. We said, well, we have to work towards solutions. Let's not only complain, let's try to move forward and let's try to make some suggestions, at least for solutions. <coughs> they are ideas, as I said, for solutions. They are not necessarily the solution, but let's, let's talk about them uh, today. And so we uh, have, I would say, three overall conditions for what we call the workable solution. Uh, after a lot of discussion with our task force, I have to say, we got to these principles or it should be really a global solution. Uh, there might be already some national solutions, but it would really be good to go to a global one. Uh, it would be good that there is some consistency uh, if we do something else for 
SMEs and audits of SMEs that it provides somehow the same level of audit comfort or assurance uh, as we are used to in, in our current environment. And whatever solution we come up to, it would really be great if it is technology oriented because we're not looking for a solution for now, but we also look for a solution to be a future proof for, for the coming years. So that would be something which would really be great to be included in the solution that we come up with. So with that, uh, we uh, started to, I would say, experiment a little bit. You know, we didn't really have a, li a little lab here, but uh, you know, our discussions were, were like a lab talking about very different things, but then uh, in the end coming to uh, the compromise as to what is in the paper as the four solutions that we have put forward. So uh, that was our level of experimentation. And how we did that, we actually, uh, said, well, uh, we don't have the solution, we acknowledge that. The approach is we will come to a proposal, a uh, recommendation, something that could be uh, uh, considered, but we will look at the pros and the cons uh, based on the discussions that uh, we hear within our environment and also in the task force. And so that's how we came uh, to actually, uh, first of all, some solutions that would be built within the ISAs, within the current standards that we use. And we considered developing further guidance to apply the ISAs. Uh, we considered uh, potentially revising the ISAs to apply a think small first approach. We will get to that. Uh, revise the ISAs to deal with language complexity. And as I said, always the undertone was it needs to be a solution that applies information technology to the ISAs. That was always a baseline. <laughs> However, we also discussed uh, that uh, potentially there is also a um, consideration to be given to develop a standalone standard alongside the ISAs or not, uh, but still definitely looking at it from the global level. And last but not least, we didn't pay too much attention to that. We also looked at some other routes, um, and uh, we, we got uh, a little bit of that. We didn't work this out in great detail. Also, what we didn't look at was reviews, like our president referred to, or we didn't look at compilation engagements. We really looked at audit and what is uh, it that we look at within doing an audit. How could we improve that to deliver a better service uh, to uh, the audit uh, in the SMEs? So as far as our solutions that are built within the ISAs, the first one was to uh, look at developing some guidance to apply the ISAs. And we were really led by uh, the thought, you know, what, that would be additional material over and above the application material, which is already in the standard, to help the practitioners scale down the ISAs. We looked at the pros and cons, and uh, that is the ones that uh, we got. Uh, we might not have worked hard enough, but we only could find one pro, and it was that this is already something that is going on, so it is a little bit the continuation of work done uh, so far. Um, somehow we managed to find four uh, uh, cons and it was uh, that uh, that's not necessarily enough to respond to the challenges. It's actually a solution that has already been tried. For instance, you are aware that the SMP uh, committee from IFAC has already uh, prepared uh, guidance uh, on that or a guide, more than one actually, on that. It would mean, again, more material, and one of the things we hear, the ISAs are very lengthy, so didn't look like uh, an appealing proposal. And uh, indeed, the uh, current ISAs are very long and complex um, as far as guidance is concerned. If you would add to that, that might not be useful. So that's the considerations that uh, we put uh, 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 in front of, of you and, uh, and, uh, and the IWSB as well, I think, to consider if that would be the solution that we go. Uh, but the panel will discuss that in further detail. The second solution, also again within the eyes as we looked at, was this um, uh, think small first approach and to revise the ISAs along those uh, lines. And uh, that was really getting into leveraging the IWSB's proportionality principle and starting to uh, actually uh, draft the standards from a think small first perspective. And when we looked at uh, the pros and cons of that, uh, maybe we're a bit more balanced here. Uh, as far as uh, proportionality, uh, what uh, we really looked at was 
if you really can do it as it is meant, it would mean that from the ISAS general objectives, you could add a think small first approach to really be able to use the standards in an SME environment. And if you really could use the scalability so that complexity, complexity can be added to each ISA depending on the specific circumstances, so it would be the other way around in a way. You have the basic requirements there, but if you need more, you can scale up rather than what we do now, scaling down. So that was the, the, the thought uh, behind this. As far as the cons, um, it was um, uh, considered that it's easier said than done. Uh, most probably the maturity of the ISAs has something to do with it because there is a certain approach that has been followed. So it's not always easy to change that. And obviously it uh, would require redrafting all the ISAs because uh, you can't just do this for a few and then not for the others because then you don't have a, a comprehensive uh, set of standards. So that's why we moved on and uh, we thought further about another uh, potential uh, way to uh, uh, resolve our issues as far as auditing smaller entities. And it was about revising the ISAs for their understandability. And it was really the idea that should we not have a, a new language complexity uh, uh, project after clarity that almost could be called a new or a perpetual uh, clarity project. And when we looked at the pros and cons there, um, we really saw that this could um, help to improve the understandability of all the ISAs. It would just not be only for SMEs, it would be for all the ISAs, and maybe that would be quite useful throughout. And indeed, it would uh, make it uh, more clear for all practitioners, for all the standards, so th there is a wider benefit there. When we looked at the cons, uh, we unfortunately uh, considered that this would be very time consuming because the previous clarity project took about um, five years or so, so it's, uh, it's not an easy thing to do. Um, and we have seen in the past there has always been a tendency to, to have language complexity because it's a scene to help to make things better explained, uh, but that does obviously make it more complex. And um, it would be considered by some at least to create instability in the ISAs because they would keep on changing and uh, that might have its, its, its drawbacks because it means you have to actually uh, rework and re-educate and retranslate and, and do many things before uh, you can actually have a stable set of standards. As I already said, within uh, the ISAs, the uh, other thing, the, the underlying baseline we looked at is that we think any solution should, should apply IT to the ISAs. Uh, it's really uh, something that uh, is, is widely considered as, as uh, uh, a need. There are some countries, uh, nine we found within Europe, that have already their own national or um, maybe shared with a few countries, the audit uh, software, the audit tools, uh, but it's, it, there is nothing near a, a, a global one, so to say. And it was considered that uh, the development of a generic methodology or software uh, is something that, that should be explored, uh, hopefully on a global level, uh, we mentioned the IWSB, but it could also be by others that, that this is done. And the, 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 the pros that we found there, because we couldn't find any in cons uh, to that, was that it would make the navigation uh, within the standards easier for all the users, for everybody, and it could also help to, uh, to remove uh, a lot of repetition in the standards. So that seemed to be quite uh, 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 noble uh, aspirations to have. So that's it as far as the solutions we could think of uh, within the ISAs. And then we moved on to look at uh, developing potentially a standalone standards alongside all the ISAs or not. That would need to be considered. And the idea would really be there if we would do that, would it then uh, be something that enhances the use of professional judgment that really would help in applying the relevant principles-based requirements that you really need in a SME environment or in an S. A in a small uh, and non-complex environment. That was really the challenge that we put to such a standalone standard. It would need to respond to that before it would be considered to be a, 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 a real answer because it is looking uh, for 
less compliance and also to have to abide uh, less to non-applicable requirements because that's one of the things that we heard uh, come back over and over again as one of the issues of the current ISAs. So when we looked at that, um, as far as the, the, the pros, uh, most people thought that that would really be a good solution because it's solution-oriented, it could be more agile, it could be uh, considered to be more quickly achieved to have such a standalone standard. It was considered that it would be uh, hopefully uh, have potential to be more relevant uh, as a service to SMEs. Uh, it could basically more easily embed the digital perspective if you go for one standalone standard. And it would uh, start from the same fundamental principles as the other uh, standards we currently know, while it still would create the possibility to emphasize professional judgment and, and, and also enable a customized approach. As far as the cons, they were more, I would say, on a uh, level of, 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 of how you deal with this then, because it would mean you have basically different sets of standards. So that might confuse, because that immediately triggers the question, which standard do you apply when? And it's a question mark. We don't have a, a, a solution or a response to that. Uh, there was also the remark that this could actually uh, uh, create a perception that this is less rigorous than the ISAs and it might obstruct wider adoption. It's not the uh, top product, so to say, not the top standard. So this might, uh, especially maybe regulators, might think twice before they go to such a solution. And um, it is uh, oftentimes, um, if you uh, think about it, it means uh, applying professional judgment, you need to be a very experienced, qualified practitioner for that. So um, if you think about its application, it's really designed for experienced practitioners, so it might hinder some application because in our profession we work in teams, so that might uh, not be entirely straightforward to do in practice. And uh, some regulators might find it uh, difficult to enforce because there is uh, potentially more use of professional judgment that might be more difficult for them uh, to, to capture. Good. We then moved on and we also uh, looked at potentially other routes to be explored. And again, we are still uh, into the mode of uh, looking at a possible solution, uh, but uh, and within the uh, audit of small entities and non-complex entities uh, uh, scope, uh, but um, I think uh, there is uh, quite some um, um, hesitation there because uh, a lot of people don't consider it to be a full response to the issues at stake. And one we looked at was uh, what is called a direct engagement or a direct engagement dimension within uh, the work of an auditor, and uh, I think it's a little bit of a combination of uh, you know what uh, the engagement of an auditor could be is to be involved in kind of calculating the closing entries, uh, something now that we expect from management to be done. Management would still take responsibility for them for that, but oftentimes they don't have necessarily the skills to do that. But the auditor would also be uh, involved in the measurement of the estimates, and uh, his direct engagement would be basically uh, related to that uh, part of it, the final estimates, to be able to come uh, to the final uh, final financial statements and a, a more assertion-based audit on the overall pro uh, presentation of the financial statements. Uh, that's something which is not very well known within our profession and also more widely. It's not always very easy to explain it. That's how we actually got to grips with it ourselves, but uh, maybe we still have questions about that. Uh, but it has some pros that you could consider. It might close the expectation gap and it might seem as v adding value to the auditor's work. Um, uh, but there might uh, also be uh, drawbacks as well. We also thought about making more uh, and fuller use of, of data analytics. Uh, when we talk about it now, it's more in the uh, higher end of the market for larger uh, audits, but uh, why not also in, in the smaller end? Uh, because it might actually, if you embed new technology, it, uh, it, it might also actually uh, uh, work in, 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 this, in, in this area of, 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 of the 
the audit market. And the pros we saw, it would leverage uh, the use of data and it would maybe make uh, considering uh, controls and testing of controls more straightforward. Um, I would say maybe to be seen. Anyhow, uh, that's uh, where we ended our paper uh, because uh, one thing is sure, uh, as far as our next steps, we consider that the status quo is not an option. Uh, and uh, we have um, written this paper to give ideas to have the debate move forward uh, like, that's, uh, like the debate we will have today. Uh, we, we are very happy to have the IWSB here and to be able to have dialogue on, on this with the IWSB. We know you work on it as well. Uh, it's about experimenting. So the, the last word of this is far from being said. Uh, further research, further work might definitely be needed. And, and, and that's uh, all about having dialogue with our members, dialogue within uh, the other profession, but also dialogue with, uh, with, with other stakeholders that have an interest in this. Um, and uh, so we hope eventually, uh, sooner rather than later, obviously, we will come to some real solutions that uh, we will be able to put in practice. So on that uh, note, I would like to pass to Arnold Schilder, the chair of the IWSB, and I am sure he will enlighten us on what they have been doing in this area. Thank you, Arnold. Thanks, Hilda, and thanks, Edelstreet, for inviting me here. I'm not sure about enlightening you today, but let me try a little bit. Um, I started my work in accountancy in an SME, SMP environment, although with a larger firm. It was a small client environment, and I did that for 13 years, and I liked it a lot. It's a great environment, great dealing with these clients. So. When my firm invited me to then move on to international clients, I in the beginning refused, but well, sometimes you don't have a choice. Um, there is a lot of history with this, and this is kind of a summary. There have been IFAC guides for a long time already. But we have also to remember that the good old days were the days of Parmalat and Worldcom and Enron and many others, so that triggered a whole reform also of the standard setting process, including the clarity process of the IWSB, which uh, was not only a complete redrafting of the standard, but also a thorough revision of about half of it. And that was the time when many of these considerations for smaller entities came into place. And I still remember my very first presentation, January 2009, I think it was you there as well. It was in Berlin, the SP Forum. And I was faced with a room full of very skeptical smaller practitioners, what this chairman of this board with all these big standards had to do there. Um, now, I was pretty well prepared, so I took the audience through all the examples with the many specific considerations for SMEs, also in the quality control standards. So, at least the atmosphere cheered up a little bit during the conference. Later on, we were grilled by, in particular, the German Institute, IDW, refused to accept the clarity ISAs because they were not enough in terms of scalability and proportionality. I could also mention the French Institutes or the Nordic Institutes. Um, so that was why we came out with um, publications like applying the ISAs proportionally, and later on also for ISQC1. Because we learned from dialogues with, amongst others, the IDW leadership that they said, well, we do know what's in the standard, but you're concerned that others don't, in particular regulators. So that's why we drafted these specific staff Q&As explaining how well the ISS can be scaled up and down. And I think that worked for a while. It became rather quiet in this area, but <laughs> let's be realistic. It's coming back, and we understand that. Um, I have annual meetings with the leaderships of the Nordic Institutes. They have grilled me over the years why we couldn't do more. And in the end, said, well, I think we have done what we could, so maybe you should do something yourselves. And they did. That's this Nordic draft standard, the SASI. 
So it's kind of a momentum, and we have looked at that, of course. Um, and in the last year, you see also changes in how we try to deal with scalability and proportionality. We've introduced the concept of the spectrum of risks, so ranging from very simple to very complex. And in the recent upcoming standards on estimates and risk assessment, you see that coming up. You see more examples of flowcharts, templates, examples to make it better understandable. Nevertheless, it doesn't go away. And then we had the Paris SME SMP Working Conference, January 2017. A great event, uh, well attended. I'm still grateful to the Institute, Isabel. Um, people from all over the world. And like in the Cogito publication, there were mixed views. Some are in favor of this, and some are in favor of that. No clear way forward. And that's basically the clear summary of this excellent document, a very balanced paper of Accountants Europe. No clear way forward. And that's, that's I think, a realistic point to start with. So after the PEDES conference, um, we thought also in the IWSB, well, what should we do more? Um, it took us a while. And that's, I think, illustrative for also the mixed feelings that we have in our own board. That uh, some are in favor of this, some are in favor of that. And then we had a couple of volunteers in the board. I said, well, let's at least have a further look on this, including how we might think that a separate standard might look like. So we got a small group of some IWSB members, and we were very much supported, uh, in all fairness, Jens, by uh, Nordic providing us with Kai Martin Hagen as an excellent staff support to this small group. And this group came to our board in March this year. And usually everything that we do is in the public domain and can be observed. This time it was not. It was an executive session, as we call it. And, and I decided to have it in an executive session that, that, is that members would feel comfortable to express whatever positive or negative feeling they would have. But we had a great conversation, and, and Kai attended that, of course. Um, my, if I take some of the key messages, lessons, challenges from that discussion, what do we see at the horizon? And I think there's much similarity then in the paper that Accountants Europe has published. Um, questions continue to be asked whether the answers are fit for purpose in an SME environment. And we understand those questions. And we don't say they are not fair questions. And we see many national and regional initiatives, as you have summarized also in your paper for Europe, to respond to what can we do. And, and many national institutes have been very helpful and said, well, this is a way we can do it, this is a way we can do it. But still, there is the lack of an international response, as you have very well emphasized. And if there is not an international response coming from us, that, that may be really perceived as a threat to the continued implementation of the ISS for SMEs. And I'm aware of various countries where that's really becoming quite visible, including in this one. And then I think a very important element of the discussion was yes. So we see that and we don't duck away. But what are really the issues then? What is it that we need to address? You first need to, find, to define the problem before you can try to find a solution. And that's very important to many of us in the board. And we recognize that basically we are the only ones who can provide a global and, and authoritative perspective for all the good reasons that you have summarized, Hilde. So some observations, and again, informed by the paper from this small group that, that Kai supported. There was also appended to that, just for the station purposes, a kind of updated version of the, the, the Nordic draft, the, the SASI draft, but then how would it look like if it would be like uh, ISAS? Um, we have not really discussed it. I just would, would acknowledge that, that it was part of the production of this voluntary group as well. And, and to my great delight, I have to say, um, all board members were very supportive for the initiative to move on with this, in whatever direction. But there was, we went through the board members one by one, 
Can you are my witness? Um, support, strong support for the initiative for consultation and recognizing thereby that an expectation has been created. We are here at the start of an expectation gap. You see it now starting, that uh, we are going to do something, but we don't know what. And then adding, there is no simple answer. And we learned that in Paris, as I said, we, you can clearly see it in the balance presentation, in the Account of Europe presentation. And I really compliment you for the pros and cons analysis. Okay, well, fair enough. We also have to recognize it's just, not just an S&P issue, smaller and medium-sized practitioners. These issues exist also in larger firms in the public sector, so that adds to the complexity and the dimensions. We may also recognize that jurisdictional responses can be different, whether it's in Singapore or in France or in Brazil. Fine enough. And maybe it's not us that would or should be the only solution. We have to be very open for the roles of others. And I'm a strong believer in that, actually. We also have to appreciate commercial considerations. It's just not a, a open and free discussion. Our practitioners are working in a very aggressive, competitive environment. So it's also helping them. And then the core, I think, is complexity and simplification. When we studied the Nordic draft, and we commented, of course, we said, well, we appreciate the initiative, but focusing on experienced practitioners, it's one issue. But also, when it comes to more complex situations, what then do you have to do? And many of the additions to the ISAs over the years have to do with responding to complexity. It's all right in a more simple environment, but when it becomes more complex, more international, and all of a sudden a small company has derivatives on its balance sheet or acquires a company outside of its own jurisdiction, how, how would you address that? And another dimension, but of course you and many others are helpful here, is the engagement with the target audience. If you're focusing on smaller practitioners, how do you get them on the table? Um, so this is a kind of key elements of the discussion in our March meeting. But as said, overall, there was strong support for doing something. So what are the next steps? Um, September, um, we expect a proposal from this so far voluntary working group um, with a project proposal. How are we going to address this? and also to establish a formal project working group. I said this was a voluntary group. It seems the best way to get it started, at least. Um, so that will be, of course, a public discussion, public documents. Uh, from now on, it, it will be there in the public domain. That's really hope. In all fairness, I had hoped that it would be already in June, but the group said, give us a bit more time. We really want to do a good job here, and I fully respect that. That's in the best interest of the project. And then, if the board agrees to the project proposal, then you have defined the starting point, and what is this project working group going to do? Then the plan is that they will draft a consultation paper um, for the IWSB to approve March next year. That would outline the issues, maybe it's just a copy of this paper, uh, maybe a bit updated. Uh, I'm looking to you, Kai, and others. Um, really outlining the issues, and also, of course, thinking hard of what is the best way forward. And then, um, Isabel, I hope you agree. Um, it hadn't been on slides before. You said, why not adding that we then would have in the second quarter of 2019 a second SMP, SME working conference. Um, I know we have been pushing for it, um, and your presidents have, um, but that seems an appropriate timing if the board agrees in March to that consultation paper then we should have a similar conference again. And I now already invite many of you. And in September, December 2019, the, then the board has to consult the results of that consultation paper and further actions. So the good news is there is a plan, there is a commitment, there is support for doing something. Um, and I wouldn't say it's bad news, but there is a big caveat. It's not easy, but let's see how we can move forward. 
So, bottom end, um, we need to keep an open mind on this. It's related to this adagium of cogito ergo sum. It was, by the way, at that time a Dutch philosopher who said it, René Descartes. So it's not just let's think. Thinking is of essence to existing and to surviving. And I think that's what we are doing here. Now, this idea of open mind is coming back in the online strategy survey consultation that we have issued the other week. I could mention on this slide, as the slide was sent out earlier. Um, and I really encourage and invite you to, to participate in that online survey. You can simply go to the IWSB website. Um, and you will hopefully some, see something that is of interest. This concept of an open mind is, is literally there. And I'm very serious on that, and the board agreed to that. And there are also specific questions on how should we spend our time in the next strategy period, 2020 to 2023. Would it be on new standards? Or should it be on a revision of the current standards? Kind of a second clarity project. Should there be a moratorium? Say, well, after we have finalized the current project, key projects on estimates, risk assessment, quality management, etc., should we hold on for a while? So that's just an illustration of the open mind. And there's also a specific question, um, and it is in terms of how much percentage should we spend our time on what, on the area of SME, SMP. And I have to confess, I've insisted a bit on, on getting that topic specifically in. Um, because then people could comment and give us a message. And therefore, I say it would be very helpful if you participate in that online survey. It's the first step in our strategy development for the next period. There will be a more formal and expanded consultation at the end of the year. But this is getting views from over the world. What is it that we, the direction that likely the board should take and that we don't should be further exploring. So, um, Edelfried, that's where we are at the moment. Um, then you said it was an important speech, but I'm not sure. I hope I haven't disappointed you. But I think, to some extent, I agree that I can at least share the commitment of the IWSB to continue working on it. And I'm really very grateful for the many challenges that I got from many of you. And we've picked them up, and I think we should. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arnold. Um, Arnold is going to stay around, and of course, we'll be, you know, we'll have the ability to ask him questions as we get into the debate later on in the afternoon. But I just thought, as if there are any burning questions from what he has just said that anyone would like to ask now before we go to Catherine Bagshaw in the UK, um, please put your hand up. Anything initial that anybody wants to? Dan, I'm looking at you and you're laughing. So do you want, who's, have we got microphones on the table? So please use the microphone. It should be on. Is it on? It's on now. Yeah. It's on now. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, uh, you said that we, we should be thinking out of the box and, and, and we, we, we don't know re for sure what we are aiming at. But what is your vision? What, what, what is... What you are hoping for is it a standalone standard or <laughs> why did you ask him <laughs> he's always asking impossible questions then i'm i'm really not sure um if i see the draft separate standard i think it's a very interesting concept at the same time i was just talking with klaus klaus if you don't you don't mind Three partners, 11 staff in your firm, dealing with a lot of international clients from all parts of the world. So here is an example of a very small firm, nevertheless dealing with a lot of complexities and auditing. Would a separate standard help there? It would not. I'm, I'm pretty sure it, it, it would not answer many of the challenges that you are facing. It's just an illustration of complexity. Um, so nevertheless, I think we should explore that as part of that consultation and let's take views. Um, I'm certainly also interested in what we can do with technology. Um, if you see the online strategy survey, it applies already a bit of simple technology. Basically, you don't have to, to read the whole document in order to arrive at the areas that you would like to address. So I wrote this just this week. Um, 
an email to one of my colleagues on ISA 220, where we have now published uh, draft board papers. Could we, maybe as an example, rewrite that standard as well by using this kind of technology? So that you only, say for example, you first have to answer the question, am I a sole practitioner? That, that would take away a lot of dealing with team members, etc. Maybe a couple of other questions. Okay, then I'm defined a little bit. And then just go to the sections in the standard that are of relevance to you. And if you need application material, that should follow from just clicking on areas where you think I would like to have help. We haven't explored much of that yet. Um, I know of some other boards where it wasn't that easy. I think this is an area that we certainly should take very much on board because if you just see the survey, it, it makes life so much easier. The third area, of course, and we're really working on that, but not far enough, is um, examples, um, templates, flowcharts. We get a lot of feedback that people like that, and still something that we get to be used to. And the fourth uh, dimension, it's a bit linked to this work of the monitoring group, where they say, well, could you have a more strategically focused board with expanded staff, focusing more on what is of essence in a standard. Because there is a process, and I, I admit that, that if you have 18 people around the table, they want to have the best standard of all places, which usually results in adding things. I have a point, I have a point, I have a point. And if you're done with that, then you have your dialogues with practitioners, with regulators, and by the way, we're missing this, we're missing that. And that's, so I acknowledge the point, it's, it's, it's building up, and sometime, somehow we need to build it down as well. So these are just building blocks then, and, and the board hasn't come any further than this, and I'm already stepping up on my toes, but nevertheless, that, that's all th that we have to take into account. And it is an area that will, after the coffee break, we'll come back and we'll be asking you what your thoughts are through a series of questions. So please start you know, thinking about, well, do you think of, you know, a separate standard is the right way? Do you think there are other possibilities? So that is something we'll come back to. Thank you very much, Arnold. Um, I'm going to now, we're going to move on because of timing to um, the UK and Catherine Bragshaw, who is the deputy chair of the SNP forum. We have Catherine there. Hopefully you can hear us, Catherine, okay? Catherine, can you hear us all right? Uh, yes, I can now. Okay. Thank you. All right. You're, we can hear you loud and clear here, so um, I'm glad technology has worked. So over to you to give us your thoughts on, on the issues in this area. Thank you very much indeed, Miles, and uh, thank you, uh, Hilda and um, uh, Arnold, for, uh, for your remarks as well. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be able to join this meeting. I'm just sorry I can't be there in person, and I am very much looking forward to the uh, panel discussion that follows this. I'd like to thank Accountancy Europe uh, on behalf of IFAX SMP Committee for convening this event and also uh, for the opportunity afforded to me to contribute to Accountancy Europe's paper on simplifying auditing standards, the paper that's being launched here today. And Arnold's right, um, there is a lot of history to this and unfortunately we live in um, interesting times. Um, not so many years ago, we in the UK had a mandatory audit requirement for all, all companies. Life was relatively simple. Now, the vast majority of UK companies are exempt from the um, audit requirement. But in other jurisdictions, uh, mandatory audit requirements are being introduced for the, for the first time. And over that same period, we've seen some very significant developments in auditing standards which are now a great deal more um, sophisticated than they were 20 years ago. They now deal with much larger and more complex situations than they did and, and that's another way of saying that over the last 20 or 30 years they, they, they have been scaled up. And the reason we're here this afternoon is to think about how those developments affect the audit of smaller entities and what we need to do to make sure that those audits continue to be workable for SMPs as well as being useful and relevant to the people who need them. Now in this context I think it's easy to 
um, overlook and indeed to underestimate the immense progress made by IAASB and the value of its work over 40 years in, in, in developing a set of very high quality, globally accepted auditing standards. That's a major achievement. And a global solution, as has, all, as has already been mentioned, I, I think is critical in, in, in helping smaller practitioners deal with the challenges of implementing um, ISAs, just as it's critical to the, the methodologies of larger firms. And, and every smaller practitioner I speak to emphasizes this. Um, now is not the time for auditing standards to to go home. Uh, and this is a job for the IAASB. It's also um, important to recognise and acknowledge the value of the work already already performed by the IAASB itself in considering scalability and proportionality. And Arnold's already. Uh, referred to this. And it seems very evident to me that, for example, um, in its project on ISO 540 on the audit of estimates, IAASB has given considerably more prominence to SME issues than it might have done um, in the past, even though the genesis of that project was at the opposite end of the scale. Now, the IAASB can, of course, do more but it already has done so by approving the project Arnold referred to earlier this year on the audit of smaller and less complex entities at its meeting in, in March. That's a major achievement in itself. Um, and I'd like to highlight the work performed by uh, IFAC's SMP committee, of which I'm currently deputy chair. Um, Hilda made reference to the um, Guide to ISIS for SME Audits, and that, that is no insubstantial piece of work. The fourth edition of that will be published um, fairly shortly, and that guide has been downloaded over 100,000 times, and there are 28 translations of it, either complete or, or in progress. It's used in more jurisdictions than I think... Uh, most people are uh, aware of, and, and, and many of them develop jurisdictions. And it represents a significant achievement for IFAC um, and for the IAASB standards uh, on which it's based. The contribution of SMEs to economies, innovation, employment, um, including increasingly to um, innovation by younger people who are working in a different environment, uh, to the environment that most of us uh, grew up in and the contribution of SMEs to employment more generally means that we really do must whatever is necessary to ensure the continuing value of the audits of these entities to a wide range of stakeholders. Um, the capital markets are not the only uh, markets and uh, to an extent um, the influence of regulators in the capital markets over uh, auditing standards, uh, it, it's been valuable and it's important, but it mustn't eclipse the, the importance of SMEs to all of our economies. And despite the fact that the vast majority of companies in the UK are exempt from audit, um, a substantial proportion of them continue to have an audit for a whole host of good reasons. They have audits because their constitutions require it, uh, because they value the discipline, because they intend to grow, or because it helps in dealing with uh, lenders and creditors and, uh, and tax authorities. And there are many very good reasons why companies value an audit, even where it's not mandated. Having said that, um, the continued existence of audit and the perceived value of it in general and the audit of small and less complex entities in particular is not guaranteed. It's not a foregone conclusion. And if we don't respond appropriately to calls for change, there is a risk of consigning SME audits and even more audits more widely to the uh, to the history books it, it, it is possible we we don't want to see that happen because we we understand the value of audit 
And for that reason, we need to take an intelligent approach to all of the issues that have given rise to the need for Accountancy Europe's paper and for IAASB's projects. And I'd just like to, to run through a few of those. A number of them have been already mentioned. First of all, well, I called it sophistication. It's usually called length and uh, complexity uh, in standards. But more than that, it's the rate of change and the impact this has on software and training providers. Uh, whose who's service uh, smaller entities, uh, smaller practitioners. Uh, the requirements for documentation and, and work on internal controls. The significant difference between the relationship between smaller entities and their auditors and larger entities and their auditors. And this is what makes uh, the option um, regarding direct engagements that um, Hilda uh, uh, referred to uh, so interesting. And I, I do hear... Um, a lot of sympathy uh, for that approach. Uh, the need for scalability to work in equal measure in both directions, both up and, and down. I have a sense that the, the balance isn't quite right yet. And then, um, Im importantly, the demarcation between application guidance and implementation guidance. I, I don't think we clearly understand the difference between the two. We need to get to the bottom of all of these issues. I don't believe they're stra straightforward, despite what some say, which is why this discussion, our discussion today, I I is needed. Now, just to step back a bit, we shouldn't forget that auditing standards are only part of the story. We can get a bit lost in this sometimes. IAASB's work on audit quality shows very clearly that the entire there is, there is a wider ecosystem affecting audit quality, and we need to be mindful in our discussions of a number of broader issues. And they include things such as the history of audit in a jurisdiction, the profession status, the quality of entrance to it, uh, the length of time ICES uh, uh, have been adopted, uh, the availability and quality of education and training, the approach of regulators and attitudes to uh, ethics, judgment and scepticism. And in short, auditing standards need to work in jurisdictions in which the modern profession has existed for just a few years and in which regulation and quality control are, are relatively new, as well as in more mature jurisdictions. Now, this is asking quite a lot, but I don't believe that it's beyond us. And simplification, a word that wasn't chosen without thought in the title to um, Accountancy Europe's paper, may well be part of the uh, solution. It, we, we shouldn't be afraid of that word. IASB is a mature standard setter and it shouldn't be afraid to experiment and to, to innovate. It's earned the right to do that over 40 years. Hilda referred to a lab. Um, IASB can think about this too. Consensus does take time to build. Arnold knows only too well sitting around that, uh, that table the, 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 the time it takes and indeed the criticism of the time it, it takes. But consensus does take time to build. But we are all learning to be more agile uh, because we have to. More research is needed on, on, on which countries are finding implementation difficult and what their common issues are. But in all of this, I think we need to remember that audits, wherever they're performed, they have a simple objective, which is to for the auditor to form an opinion, either a fair presentation or truth and fairness of the financial statements. And SMPs are less likely than anyone else to, to forget this. It's not just about process, methodology, the status of the guidance, although all of these things um, are important. We need to remember that process and methodology don't deliver opinions. Auditors do. And we'll hear directly from auditors of SMEs in, in, in the panel um, uh, discussion. So um, to finish... And, and to be clear, I believe we're at the start of a journey here. Um, uh, Hilda uh, said at the outset that the status quo is no longer uh, an option and Accountancy Europe's paper opens this debate. Now, maybe I need to get out more, 
But I believe that this paper that's being launched today, IAASB's project, and indeed the proposals we've already seen from the Nordic Federation are all very um, significant. And as a technical specialist, I also find them quite exciting. And I really do look forward to hearing these discussions both today and, and, and going forward, because this really could be the start of the single most important change to the audit of SMEs uh, in, in a generation. We live in interesting times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine, and um, thank you, everybody. We are now going to, um, and we'll, we'll have hopefully the ability to come back to Catherine maybe later to um, get her views um, from some of the panel discussions, but we'll see how we go with technology and time. We're now going to have a very quick coffee break, so please keep 10 minutes, but I'm going give to you, give you a bit of a, um, some work to do over the coffee break. We're going to use an application called Slido to... Um, ask you some questions um, in the next session. So please, um, if you've got an iPhone or, a, or an iPad, or you, know, you can download that from the App Store, or if you're on a computer, you can go to www.slido, and then you, you put the invent code in, and then that takes you to where the questions will be and where you can vote. So please, during the break, do download that. Make sure it's on your phone, on your, on your laptop, and we'll be back here in 10 minutes. Thank you.
<laughs> you don't need a pen. You're the moderator, yeah? I need a pen for stuff you know, like that. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being prompt and coming back. I'll just let everybody settle down, and I hopefully you've all done your homework and downloaded the Slido app so that um, we can get you voting. You'll you have a few more minutes to do that, so please. Please get that. The, the password is SME audit, all uppercase. So it should be very easy to remember. So uh, that's the code you need to put in. Anyway, welcome back and um, welcome to all the panel members here. I'm going to get each of the panel members 
to introduce themselves and say a few words about you know, their interest in, in this area. So you won't um, get any long introductions from myself, but just a, a little bit of background about, about me. Um, I am chair of the Accountancy Europe Audit and Assurance Policy Group. Um, I've been an audit partner in the UK for one of the large firms for many years. But it was interesting what Arnold said about um, I spent a lot of time working in some of my uh, the smaller offices in the north, and you get a lot more experience actually of auditing, working on um, the audits of small companies, private companies, and um, you know I greatly benefited from that. You know, in, in then moving onwards and working on more listed clients. So I think it is a very good grounding, and you shouldn't we shouldn't forget about how important that is for education and everything. Okay, and um, I'm now going to. We're going to do this in order of on the slide, so I'm going to start with Kai, who's going to say a few words, and then we'll we'll um, we'll go through go through the list. Kai, thank you, Miles. Uh, my name is Kai Mortnagen. Oh. I'm technical manager in Norwegian Institute, and I guess the reason why I'm here is that I've been uh, <laughs> a project manager on the uh, Nordic uh, SASE standard that was mentioned earlier. Um, but I've also been part of the group that uh, Arnold mentioned in preparing for the IWSB board, the exploring further the uh, ISA issue on uh, audits of SMEs. <clears throat> um, in the Nordics, there is a huge number of SMEs, and we have a long tradition for audits. That's kind of the reason why we started this ASIC project. And we believe that audit is a valuable service and con will continue to be. But in order for that to happen, you need the standards to be relevant for the uh, practitioners and the audit to be done. So that's kind of the background for our project as well. Thank you, Kai. Also, just wanted to mention that, of course, this isn't just a European issue. Um, I think Arnold mentioned that this is you know, very much a global issue. And, and I've actually been working for our global firm for um, the last four years before returning to the UK and been talking to a lot of our practices around the world. And this is very much um, an issue, especially in Asia and South America. And I'm very glad that we've got Svetlana here from Canada. And Canada have always been a big driving force um, in the SME arena. So, um, Svetlana, over to you. Thank you. Do I need a, I'm, I'm, I have a mic right here, okay. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Svetlana Berger. I am a principal with the Canadian Auditing and Assurance Standards Board. Um, does it work? Yeah. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, so just in opening remarks, I'd like to uh, give you a brief overview of the Canadian SME environment and why we think it's important that the ISIS be scalable to audits of all sizes uh, and levels of complexity. So we are a country that is very much dominated by uh, small entities. Uh, as you can see, nearly 98% of our 1.2 million businesses are considered small entities, 54% of our businesses are micro entities, so fewer than five employees, and only 1.8% is mid-size. Just a little bit more about Canada. Um, you know, we have one set of standards that applies to, uh, to all entities. We have a large number of small cap Canadian public companies that many of them are in the natural resource sector. In terms of private companies, uh, Canada Business Corporation Act allows uh, private companies to opt out of audits, and so many turn to alternative services like review engagements and compilation engagements. In Canada, reviews and compilations are well established. Um, you know, we were very comfortable with them, and I understand that that's not the case in, in other parts of the world where those services are not uh, so popular. Uh, the, the, the type of engagements that, um, that our practitioners are engaged by, uh, smaller entities are really driven by, by what, uh, what, what, what the financial uh, statement users need. And so, you know, we have lots of micro entities that don't have any external users and a compilation engagement is just fine. Uh, or they have uh, the lenders as an external user and, um, and they're willing to accept review engagements and even compilation engagements because the lender can always go back to management and ask for more information. 
uh, we have adopted the uh, ISAs as Canadian standards with minimal amendments. Uh, so these are our standards, and it's one set of standards that applies to all entities. <laughs> I guess uh, you know. I just wanted to say. I guess the concern that we've uh, the, that we've had is that over the years we've seen downgrading from uh, audits to reviews to compilations, and it's just a downward spiral. Uh, you know, and, I, I, and and sometimes that's an appropriate downgrade because uh, the the needs of users change. But uh, what we've also heard from our practitioners is that they're moving away from audits. Uh, it's just too complex, uh, too risky, too costly. And so, you know, they've been encouraging their clients to move away from audits. We've been hearing from our lenders that they've been pressured to accept, um, you know, to accept a lower level engagement. So um, that for the profession is, is concerning. Um, and um, I think the scalability of the ISAs uh, is probably a contributing factor to that. So I thank you for being invited to be a panelist here. I'm, um, I look forward to hearing the global views on this, and I will provide you um, some Canadian perspectives of what we hear from our practitioners. And I just wanted to say that whatever I say here is really uh, from the lens of practitioners uh, who have um, who have who we've consulted with. It is not a board view. Our board has has informed a view in any of the issues that we've been uh, this, that will be will will be discussing today. So, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Jill. Yep. Hi, I'm Jill Spall, uh, and I work for More Stevens. I'm the European Technical Director of More Stevens, which is a mid-tier network. Um, when you hear the word mid, the phrase mid-tier network, you might think, well, yeah, what does she know about SMEs? Um, but many of our member firms are um, SMP practices, uh, which which perform audits for SMEs and smaller. Um, as we all know, throughout Europe, the uh, exemption limit is different uh, across across the, the, the variety of member states that we have in the European Union. And so many of my network's member firms do perform audits for very small entities and are themselves small firms. We also have large firms course. Um, so I kind of straddle the divide. Um, in in uh, not another life, the same life, lived at the same time. Um, I also um, do a lot of stuff for the ICAW. I'm chair of the uh, quality panel and uh, I'm also a member of the ISA implementation task force. And as part of that, I've contributed to um, ICAW publications attempting to demonstrate how ISAs can be, you know, used by smaller firms for smaller audits, uh, and also how ISQC1 um, can be can be scaled for by smaller firms. Um, so, you know, I do have some experience of the challenges that are faced by small firms performing smaller firms performing audits of small and medium-sized entities. Um, but on the other hand, I am one of those awful people who go around saying to people, you're not doing it right, you're not complying. Um, and I can't deny that. So, <laughs> Too many hats on, Jill, I think. I have many hats. Um, and lastly, um, Klaus. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Klaus Bertram. I'm <clears throat> the managing director of a small audit and tax advisory firm in Mannheim, Germany. Um, we are a small uh, company with uh, uh, three partners, 11 staff, and we are um, performing audits um, uh, using um, German auditing standards, uh, which are uh, fu which fully comply with with ISOs. And uh, we we are looking forward uh, because we want to perform audits also in the future. And uh, this is a challenge uh, when you are a, a small uh, audit firm. Um, besides uh, of uh, being a managing director of an audit firm, uh, I've also, uh, also been um, involved in um, the interests of the um, uh, of auditors. I uh, work for, uh, at the IDW in the um, auditing and accounting board for for about 10 years now and uh, since 2016 I'm a member of the uh, IFAC SMP committee as well 
And last but not least, uh, I was a member of the task force uh, uh, which developed this paper here. And um, yeah, that's, that's, I think, is enough for me. Okay. Thank you for that, and hopefully that gives you a bit of background of, of all the panel, um, panel members. We're now going to start um, with some polling questions, and um, hopefully we'll be able to move on to those, so with Slido. Um, just a couple of things. Slido also um, allows you to ask questions of the panel, so if you do have any questions, there are, as you see when you go into the application, you have polls and questions. So um, this does allow you to um, ask questions of the panel that are outside um, of the polling questions. How we're going to work this is while you're voting, I'm going to ask each of the panel members their thoughts on this question. So I'm not getting them to vote, but I'm going to ask them their thoughts and, and what they think. And then we'll see how that correlates um, with the views of the audience. And then we'll have a discussion with the audience. So, and as Arnold said, I think in his presentation, you know, the main area that we need to start with is understanding, well, what is the issue? You know, what are the fundamental problems that people have? Um, and this is difficult probably to put into a polling question, um, but we're, and you can choose three, I think, is your, your ability to, you're allowed to pick three of these. But I'm going to start with you, Jill, if that's all right. <laughs> to, to get your thoughts on this and what you see as, as you say you tell people that they're not doing the things right well why aren't they doing it right what's the problem I don't think we have enough time to <laughs> but uh, anyway um, well I wasn't expecting to be asked first uh, but there we go the perils of knowing Miles. Um, I mean, if you you want to know what I think are the three my three top picks. Well, you pick one of them. What do you think is the main? Well, I mean, well, it, for me, uh, option A is a non-runner because there are fundamental problems. Clearly, not for everybody. I've seen some superb um, audit files, uh, fully compliant, um, done to budget. You know, for 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 small entity audits, but maybe those people were lucky. Who knows? But um, we know that people are having problems. Um, so so I think we can discount A. I think B is a given. Um, something hasn't been considered sufficiently. Hence, there is a problem. So I wouldn't pick B. Um, I think we have more than enough guidance. Frankly, I think we might have too much guidance. If you think about the uh, application material, um, it makes people want to cry. Um, and, and there are many training tools. Uh, we're going to be talking about IT, I think, during the course of this afternoon. Um, at least I was asked to have things to say about that. And what I would say about training tools is that sometimes they're great and sometimes they're really not. And sometimes it's exactly the same tool that is being both great for some people and really not great for other people. Because I think people put far too much faith, it's touching really, but people put far too much faith in the power of technology to solve all their problems um, without realizing that uh, it can't. So I'm not sure about C. However, D, I think, is a very good one. I think people do have issues determining what it is they're supposed to be doing, what they can safely not do in particular circumstances, what they always need to do. Um, and so, you know, you can come across, um, circum anecdotally, you can come across circumstances where people are both over-auditing and under-auditing on the same account balance, in, you know, on the same job. Um, because the, 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 because they find it difficult to determine what's going on. So that may be one. I'm going to stop you there. There you go, then. I was actually <laughs> going to say F's my biggest one, but there you well, go. Well, I did ask you, as you didn't answer the question when I did ask what was your biggest one, <laughs> your main one, but anyway. F is your thing. Klaus, what your thoughts on this? Thank you, Mart. Um My biggest uh, one or major answer is also F. Um, the doc documentation requirements um, is, is the biggest issue for for SMPs, I, I think. Um, especially, um, it's somehow it is linked with uh, question uh, question D or answer D. Um, you not only 
always know whether an, a special requirement is applicable or not. And this leads to the documentation as well. And uh, documentation is, uh, is a big issue for SMPs, especially um, if, uh, uh, if they don't have the, the right tools to, um, to deal with, 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 the, with the ISAs. They need to have some sort of um, uh, audit program or audit software to, to lead them, uh, the, the staff, through the, uh, through the audit. And uh, the documentation issue for me is, uh, is the biggest issue. Yeah. Sorry, I'm um, having said I didn't want to say any more, I'm butting in now. Um, I, Klaus was, was talking about F, and I, I'd also said F, F, that's the one, F. But um, I'm not sure it's always the requirements that are the issue. I think sometimes it's people's interpretation of the requirements. And it's not just the practitioner's interpretation of the requirements, it's also sometimes the regulator's interpretation of the requirements, I think, because um, I've seen so many files where people have written reams of stuff that they really didn't need to write, and it took them time to write it, and and it's great, sometimes it's entertaining, um, but, it, but it's not necessary if you look at the standard, and it's not necessary if you look at where they're trying to get and what it is they're trying to achieve. And equally, then, we see people not writing enough um, a lot of the time um, when they really did need to, but you can't necessarily blame the requirements. I think, I think it's an understanding of the requirements that is often, and, and an understanding of why the requirements are there. And I think we could certainly look at them in our mythical project of rewriting everything. Um, but I think, I think um, people have forgotten why there are documentation requirements. They think they document because the standard says they have to document, rather than remembering that what they're doing is telling the story of what they did, why they did it, and what it's told them. Um, and I think we need to get back to, to that idea of what documentation is actually for. But that's just my view. Okay. Your views on, on this question and what so, you're seeing in Canada? So when we asked our practitioners that same question, um, the, the view was that a common theme that we've been hearing is that there isn't enough implementation support to help them bridge the gap between the complexities of the ISAs and then doing performing the, uh, the audit in an effective and efficient way. Um, we've been hearing that, you know, that the smaller for a smaller firms just don't have the same technical support as the larger firms to uh, to help with uh, customizing their audit methodology, and so they rely on these off-the-shelf packages, where um, you know where, where and then they end up filling extensive uh, checklists and uh, over documenting. And we've also heard we have a list of uh, of areas in the ISAs that practitioners have pointed to that are just very hard to scale. And so we've accumulated a list of those. But I think what is worth mentioning is, um, is the inspection reports from the regulators, because year, of, year after year, the findings have been that um, that uh, practitioners in SMPs are just struggling to apply to apply the risk uh, the risk based model to uh, to audits, and you know they've been used to applying a substantive approach to to their testing, and um, and just haven't gotten away from that, and so. You know, maybe if they would have applied the risk-based model properly, uh, then maybe the the work effort would have would have decreased. So, you know, what is the basis of it? Is it uh, could it be because 315 and 330 are just complex to understand? Is it not enough training to? to uh, educate people as to how to use the risk-based model? Is it too difficult to apply to, uh, to audits of small entities? I, you know, I think we don't really know what is the fundamental problem. And, uh, you know, because training and all that, it seems like a solution. But what is the problem is, is something that I think we, uh, we're still looking to find out. One of the things that I want to will link into that, and I'll come back to later, is the use of technology in the audit. Because when you were talking about, you know, um, the risk-based model and substantive audits, um, and I know in, you know, in Sweden, um, they, they are using 
significantly on the small entity audit um, data and analytics tools because it is easy to extract data from those audits, it is easy to run through, and so whether that actually also is a solution. When I know we talk about technology in, in how you apply the ISAs or how you bring the ISAs to life or, or how practitioners use the ISAs, but I think we should also think about how technology can be used in the audit to make it easier for SMEs. So that's something maybe we need to think about. Kai, I haven't forgotten about you, so I, you won't be last next time, and Jill won't be first next time, so uh, <laughs> someone has to be first, so your it's perceptions hard. on this. Yeah, it's hard to disagree with what the others have said here, and I think that's all true, um, but the problem in my mind starts with the uh, option B, that there is insufficient consideration of small entities in developing the standard, so that they're overly complex and needs to be scaled down in order to to uh, audit the least complex entities um, because they are somewhat different in characteristics that could allow for a different approach if you think about ISO 315 for example maybe you could do a little bit different in order to understand the entities and identify the risks because they're smaller and easier to understand um, if you were to look into other uh, businesses if you look at the flight manual for a uh, Cessna I think that's different than uh, the flight manual for uh, Boeing 787. There are differences if you are dealing with the least complex or the more complex entities. Well, we are trying to, with the same standards, uh, do them all. Okay. Um, can we see the results now? <laughs> Is it conclusive? And I can't even remember that. Well, F is the, the, F, is the F is the top one, which was here, and then the extent of the work. I just wonder now, just open up. You know, are there any thoughts in in the room about why, you know, you voted in the way you did? What you think there are other issues? I know there are quite a few questions coming through, which we will pick up later. And there's a, a plea from Arnold to make sure that you all. Um, do this at the the survey which he mentioned earlier and i'm sure when at the end or something we'll we'll make sure that people have that the link to that survey in some way when we send out you know email or whatever it is at the end um are there any thoughts on this is anybody else got any other views about what the issues are what have they seen in their countries anyone willing to you, there's microphones on all tables so please speak up if you want to say anything Any thoughts? Yeah. Okay. Andrew. So I did actually. It should be on. Yep. Okay. Um, so I did actually vote for insufficient guidance and I reread the question. And uh, there is a lot of guidance out there. And actually, I think one of the challenges that I find is that the SMP guide, which is very good, but it's just so volum such a big volume, so difficult to navigate. People get it and think, I can't find my way around this. And I think we need to find a way of making that guidance that we have available easier to navigate, use some of the new technology in there so that people can actually find the information that they need to tailor their audits appropriately from within that big volume of guidance that exists. Any other thoughts at this time? Oh, John? Yes, uh, it may be stating the obvious because normally we look at the top of such lists, but um, it, it appears there's nobody in the room whatsoever who doesn't think there's a, a problem. Uh, and maybe those people are all somewhere else, not, not at this event. But um, I, I think that, for me, says a lot anyway, that there's nobody that thinks nothing needs to be done. And I suppose my take on the answers, I mean, the, the top answer is yes, you know, it's three quarters of you have picked have picked that, um, but there is not really much consensus on what some of the other issues are, and I think that's why it's it's actually going to be very difficult um, for the IWSB to sort of try and work their way through all this to understand what what is the real issues and what um, you know how how can you find a solution? Because if you don't understand the issues, you can't you can't really um, develop a solution. Christian, are you wanting to say something? There's a, yes. Is there a 
Oh, no, there's no mic on your table. Ah, oh, that's because Kai nicked it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, is it on? Yeah. Yep. I think actually I voted for other as well because the audit inspectors, I think, play a huge role in this model and, and you were alluring to that from, from Canada uh, because they can both drive complexity and they can do the opposite and they can enter into the discussions with, with the profession and with the individual auditors. <laughs> So I think they play a huge role in making this work. Very stringent audit inspection drives you down complexity. So, so I think that's part of the answer as well. Any other thoughts? Any, thought, any more thoughts from the panel on the answers? Just, yeah. I just want to give a quick response to what Jill said, mm -hmm. um, because um, I do think you you are right. One thing is um, documentation of audit procedures which are performed. This is uh, necessary, and if you don't uh, know how to um, uh, prepare a good do documentation, it's an issue of uh, of training. Um, but uh, what what else comes in uh, into what we have to consider is documentation um, of. Um, of things which which are which are not applic applicable in these circumstances. This is a lot of documentation and, and uh, work to be done. At least the um, SMPs think they have to um, make this documentation um, be because of the regulators, the quality control uh, process, and all the stuff. And I think uh, this is an area where we can. Uh, get more improvement if it if if a uh, if a requirement is not applicable um, no one should call for document uh, too too much documentation why it's not applicable and so on this is an yeah i i was struck by that when i read the when i read the paper uh, the comment that, that about people complaining that they spend a lot of time documenting what they're not going to do um, and, and that is my experience too, that people do that. Um, and I think it's, it's quite a shame because you, you sometimes see uh, people spending a lot of time explaining what they're not going to do and not spending any time or not enough time explaining why they're fine with some of the evidence that they've actually obtained. And that's because, you know, they are, I think, afraid of the regulators. Well, well that was you know. the point I was going to you know, mention, is it because, you know, they've got these 10 requirements and they know that five of them are not applicable to them, but they've got to document why they're not applicable because yeah. that's what the regular regulatory what environment feel feels is say. required. Yeah. And, and, and it will be interesting, and I'm, I'm going to look at Jan sometime on, on this, of course, because the Netherlands does have a regulator who covers both the listed market you know, and the unlisted market, and I believe they set the standard the same for all of the, all the audits. So I may come back to you. I'm just giving you warning to think about how you can um, consider that. And the only reason I'm picking on him is he's got this lovely tie on. <laughs> I think... Any more views from the audience? Because then I think we maybe will move on to the next question. And this next question is, well, I'll let Naomi. It's, it's following on from this, and it's also actually following on from something that Arnold mentioned about um, you know, how in ISA 540 they're trying to put more examples and application material of how you apply this um, standard or how you apply standards to um, the SME environment or to an SME audit. And I think, and I know there are some non-practitioners um, in the room, but so if you, but this consideration specific to smaller entities has been in all standards um, for a number of years. And there's normally a piece at the end in the requirement section, and then it refers to a lot of the application material that talks about this. And really, we wanting to, to understand, you know, is that helpful? Is that something that you think is helpful? If, if, you, you, know, if you are unsure, say unsure, um, or do you think it is unhelpful? It's just one of the questions, seeing, you know, what your thoughts are on this. And while, while we're doing this, I'm going to maybe start as... As Klaus is a, the practitioner here, um, do you think it's helpful? It's a difficult question, I have to say. <laughs> of course, uh, um, option A seems to be very obvious. 
uh, to say, yes, these are uh, special sections for the considerations of uh, specific to smaller entities, uh, and, and um, um, this should be helpful. But uh, on the other side, um, I think um, maybe here the, the question is not too perfect uh, uh, um, uh, because I would much more prefer if uh, the ISIS have a section uh, special uh, consideration specific to listed companies. Uh, this, <laughs> yeah, this this would be, uh, from my perspective, a, a better a better option. So. Um, I have to say, if I have to choose between these three options, I have to say, well, C probably. I'm not sure what is the right answer to this. So in Canada. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so in, uh, in asking our S&P practitioners this question, many said that they do find it helpful. Uh, and it really is because it recognizes the simpler nature of a small audit and it's kind of a justification for documenting for less documentation. They, um, they did know that the guidance seems to be f too focused on issue identification and not enough on on the application of it. And so what they wanted to see is more, you know, how do you execute the requirement and, and what requirements are or are not applicable. And that's what really is important. Um, they said also that this, these sections are scattered throughout the ISAs and sometimes they didn't even know it exists or it's hard to find. And so, you know, can we put it in one document that is easier to find? But I think having said all this, what we've seen from the IAASB is that they're moving away from these sections. I think they're recognizing that including sections that are um, relevant to smaller audits are, are not going to solve the problem. Um, I think you can have some complex uh, aspects in small entity and some, and some simple aspects in large entities. And so, you know, we see, for example, in ISA 540, you have some small, we have some small listed entities that may have very complex accounting decisions to make about impairments and, evalu and valuation. So maybe it's not about the size, maybe it is about uh, more about the complexity, and um, and that's what, um, what what needs to be considered as a uh, you know as, as consideration. I would I would fully agree with with that, especially with with 540, mm -hmm. because um, and I luckily I have a seat on the IWSB CAG, and it was something I was raised at the last meeting when we were discussing 540. You know, when I look at the way, um, you know, auditing complex impairments in listed companies or, or non-listed companies, ISA 540 is great. It takes you through the process. It is really good. But where I've just got a um, bad debt provision that I need to audit, then, you know, and I think I know the examples are being built to, and I think that's the challenge that, that we gave, the, the CAG gave also to, to the task force is to think, you know, how can, you've got to look at both, both um, spectrums in here of, of the complex piece and the non-complex piece. Kai, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I agree with what's been said so far, but I think the, it starts out by uh, having the standards that are driven at the large and complex entities at start you need to scale back uh, and then with these uh, having these considerations uh, it has been said here there are even more things to read for the practitioners and I'm somewhat unsure where the regulators uh, and inspectors uh, when they have in their inspection how much they judge and use these uh, these uh, considerations and if the practitioners then can rely on them uh, in, when it comes to an inspection, because they, from what we've seen, it's they get somewhat of a different standing than the standard itself. Lastly, Jill, any more thoughts? Well, not really. I, I'm also unsure um, because you know sometimes they are helpful, but sometimes they're not. But um, I also agree with uh, what I think everyone has said, which is that it's almost like they're a physical manifestation of, of the fact that it's the wrong way around, that the main body of the ISA should be what applies to everything. And then it should be special considerations for more complicated, more complex circumstances, or larger entities, or PIEs, or w whatever you want to add on top. Um, and as Kai said, it's something extra for the for the practitioners who are performing small and medium-sized audits 
to read when it really should be the other way around. It, it, it should be the practitioners who are performing the most complicated audits who have more to read. Okay. Should we publish the results, Naomi? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Racks by indecision. <laughs> well, um, well, I'd like to say, I suppose, will anybody admit and say why they voted no? Is anyone willing to um, admit they voted no and, and give a reason for that? Andrew, you voted no. <laughs> Very happy to confess. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I voted no uh, for the reasons given by the panel that it should be the other way around. Uh, it also it does impose upon the SME auditor the responsibility of taking auditing standards and making them simple. Um, and for the reasons given in the in the Cogito paper, we feel that's quite a difficult job. It's going to take a long time. Um, so it does feel a bit um, a bit rich asking an SME auditor to do that in the context of a uh, a small entity engagement. Any other thoughts on, on this from the, from the room? Just, we're going to, in a minute, we're going to move on to um, some of the solutions and think more about the solutions. But I just wanna, did want to pick up a couple of the questions that have come through, and actually one from, from Andrew. And I know this was raised um, a bit here, and so I'm going to ask all of you, to what extent are regulators responsible for SME auditors' concerns with ISIS? we mentioned about the regulatory piece and um, you know is that a real issue and so is there a is part of the solution you know dealing with regulators let's say rather than the standards so I don't know who I'm going to start with um, Kai are you happy to <laughs> start with this <laughs> yeah I think it's difficult to answer what the, uh, what the solution there might be uh, Uh, the regulators, whether or not we can form their opinion on what they should judge, uh, it might be difficult. Um, but I think it's not only the regulators that are driving uh, the what could be seen as more like the checklist approach. I think also the audit firms, by their own methodologies and risk management uh, uh, internally, are driving the same thing by uh, doing their uh, controls based on the same uh, checklists for... Uh, looking for have you completed this have you done this the same way rather than going into and analyzing the what they actually have done and whether or not they reach the uh, the assurance that they should if they have su sufficient appropriate audit evidence i think that might also be some of the view there jill i know you you raised the, the issue about the regulator and what you see so i i think it's not necessarily so much the regulators as if they were one, you know, cohesive group that all behaved the same way and thought the same thing and did the same thing when, of course, they're not. Um, I think it might be fear of the regulator or perception of what the regulators might do um, that, that drives a lot, a lot of this. Um, because, you know, uh, there hasn't been any, but perhaps some, some ambitious or strange academic could do some research to actually see how often um, regulators do, you know, um, uh, take a, a very strong view, um, perhaps stronger than, you know, it, it, in the way that anecdotally firms believe they do. So I think I think it is more fear and 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 kind of urban urban legend. Okay. The, it's myths. Yeah, well, no, no. maybe. Because how often do many SME auditors, they don't see the regulator that often, do they? They might get reviewed every three years, every five years. In some countries, it's six years. Um, but they hear the rumours and they, and, they, and they feel driven towards the box ticking and the checklisting and, you know. Okay. And in Canada, is, that, is this uh, an issue? 
you know, <laughs> probably. Uh, but uh, you know, I'm I'm just not sure what we can do as standard setters to educate the the regulators. I think what we can do is just make it as clear as possible in the standard what applies, what doesn't apply. So you know, so so practitioners can point to it and say it does not apply and it's clear. Or um, you know, I, I don't know if there is any any statistics to show that, that it's the regulators, it's really, yeah. Klaus, any thoughts? Do you, you must be regulated. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, I, uh, I think the regulators are, to some extent, responsible uh, for the SME auditors' concerns with ISAs. Uh, regulators are part of the standard set setting process. They, uh, they play an important role in that. What, what is interesting for me, and I don't really understand it, um, we, uh, once an ISA is published and uh, um, it, is, uh, it, in, and it uh, is in practice, um, it seems to be that practitioners are understanding it differently than regulators. Documentation is already an example uh, I, I made, be, made before. Um, so um, it seems to be that although the standards are very well uh, d done, um, that they um, still left space for interpretation what procedures are necessary to come to an audit op op opinion because otherwise it's not understandable how often um, um, regulators are uh, finding some, um, um, some things in, in, in the files of the, of the auditor which from their perspective is not in line with the ISAs. It seems to me that we need more uh, more clarification on, on this. Okay. So I think for that also what you see in many countries is that the ones that are doing the inspectors, uh, more and more of them are now having legal background rather than having an audit background, which makes it also easier for them to go through and do an inspection based on whether or not that you've completed the requirements that are there, not going into the audit itself. That may also be part of the issue. It may be interesting, to, um, we all know that the um, regulatory environment in the Netherlands is very challenging, probably more challenging than it is in the UK. And Jan, it would be just, in, you know, if you've got any perceptions of this, whether you, you know, is this something that, that concerns, you know, that the SMEs are being, uh, the sort of the audit SMEs is being held up to the same standard, which may be the right thing as, as audits of listed companies, but how does your regulator um, deal with this? Difficult question. D difficult, <laughs> difficult question. Uh, a few things to mention. Uh, one, yeah, at least there is a perception that uh, people are doing procedures for the regulators. At the same time, uh, the AFM in their last report uh, found uh, somewhere about 40% of non-compliance uh, non-compliant files in their review of the large, uh, the large four firms, and uh, one of the issues was that those firms themselves said, "Yeah, we also had a look at those files, and most of them we think they are also non-compliant." That's one thing to mention. Another thing to mention is that that uh, the AFM has oversight over all firms. They perform the oversight of the firms that perf uh, perform public interest audits for the uh, public interest entities and also for the non-public interest entities. For the other firms, they delegate it to SRA and the MBA. SRA is a group of uh, SME, uh, of SMPs. Uh, SMP, uh, SRA last week reported that 82% of the firms that performed uh, that performed statutory audits were compliant. Those they they used the same level that the AFM of they used the level that the AFM sets. So uh, at least in the Netherlands, 
uh, at least from that you could conclude that there is more to quality and that's not, not just a regulator. And that, that, that uh, so I'm, I, I've mixed feelings uh, with this, this question. At least there is a perception. What we see, at least the last two or three years that we have as MBA, because one of the panelists said, uh, what can you do as a standard setter? You can at least talk to a regulator. And that's what we actually do in the Netherlands. And we have quite an active discussion with them. And also discussing uh, what the requirements should mean in a certain situation. So um, although coming from a uh, country where we have sometimes a difficult regulator, I'm not so negative. Okay. Very interesting. And any other thoughts on this before we move into the solution piece? So, should we move on to the next question? Is that? And then we'll come back to these questions again. So I have them. Um, so. We're coming back to really the question, I think Dan raised this um, with Arnold, and it is, of course, one of the possible solutions. You know, should we effectively have a separate standard? And it's the way the Nordic region were going with, that, with our standards. So um, I'm probably going to start with you, Kai, on this, because um, as you started the ball rolling as a region on this, and I suppose it'd be useful to understand, well, why you thought this was necessary and, you know, what... Well, I presume your answer is yes to this question. <laughs> so, um, good to get your th initial thoughts on this. Yeah, if we were to, to step back a little bit to say, what we did we do before we uh, tried to do a separate standard? Uh, all the countries uh, in the Nordics have developed uh, separate guidance and training material. In Norway, the Institute also had a methodology and audit tool uh, available to all the members that they could use in order to, to document and do their audit uh, in. Um, we, did, we didn't see that that really solved the issue. So adding guidance on didn't help us. We even had a project asking the members in that group saying, if you were to do an audit not thinking about the standards, how would it look? And it ended up looking pretty much like the ISAS because that was the, what they were used to. And so as Arnold said, he's been pushed by the Nordic region at the annual meeting each year. And he challenged us by saying, what would you do? And then uh, we said, let's try to develop a separate standard, standalone standard for, for audits of small entities. Um, with that, we said we wanted to keep it at the same high quality as the ISAs. We wanted to step back uh, and have more principles based and allow for more use of professional judgments as we were in the ISAs before. Before we started having the more complex issues and detailed requirements in there. So we wanted to stay, take a step back and say this is the core of the audit, this is the level, and if you were to need in, in, come into more complex issues, you need to add things on. And rather than scale down, you're scaling up. Uh, so that was kind of our starting point. Uh, personally, we believe that if we were to do a separate standard, then you also uh, allow for more uh, development, both for specifically for large and complex entities, but also then for the smaller, less complex areas. You can do have going with technology and time comes, it might be that the, they could potentially go in different direction. You, you don't know, but then you will allow for that development. And if we were to look at uh, redrafting all the ISAs, uh, having uh, to do uh, building block principle by le less, least complex and then adding things on, um, I think that's uh, a big task and challenge to take on. It will be quite hard to complete, so yes, uh, we believe that the separate standard is the solution. Position in Canada? So that's not what Canadian practitioners believe. Sorry, Kai. No, like when we asked this question, there was just 
discomfort. And from a Canadian perspective, you know, a separate standard would just be a difficult thing to sell uh, because just because it'll create a fourth level of a fourth level engagement. As I said, we already have a very established market for compilations and reviews, and then you know we add a fourth level standard. Um, also, there's just a lot of questions of what this what is the separate standard means? Is it tagged on to you know is is does it tie to the ISAs and could a practitioner uh, kind of flip back and forth on as required, and um, you know, or is it a totally separate standard? And if it's tied to the standard, how would we maintain in sync? Uh, and when would you use one standard versus another? What's the scope of it? So uh, you know, so there's just a lot of discomfort with the idea that they haven't read any any anything to to kind of give a view on, but it's just the reaction. Um, but I th I think that um, even if if a separate standard would be developed, I think we would still need to deal with the ISIS. Because I think the, ice, the problem with the ISIS are not going away. Um, there are different elements of complexities and different audits under the ISIS. And so the issue is still going to be there. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of our perspective. Yeah. Just coming back on the reviews sure. versus audits, because mm -hmm. you've mentioned reviews a lot. Um, and I'm getting the perception in Canada that of course, if you not required, you know, many entities are not required at all. Mm. It. And so, yes, they can have the review or the compilation. But, but what is driving them not to have an audit? Is it cost? Is it, you know, is there a, you know, could a standalone standard help those entities, you know, move actually some of those entities away from review compilation to having an audit because they can see that it can be easily done or is that something that maybe help drive that? I mean, it's it's very much financial statement user driven, and not all users need an audit level assurance, and so they're okay with the lower level assurance. They're even okay with compilations. And as I said, the um, our our lenders many accept compilations, and it's because it's just one source of information. There's others that they use in making lending decisions. They can always go back to management and request information and get it. So it's it's really uh, you know, uh, cost probably, but also just just users' needs. Not everybody uh, needs an audit, and it's it's still a, you're still getting a level of assurance. It's just a lower level of assurance. Um, but I understand that uh, you know around around the world, the idea of this negative conclusion is just not not very comforting for people. And it's because maybe you come from an audit world where you're used to the positive opinion. Uh, where for for years have been operating. You know, we've, we've had compilations and reviews, and so our market is quite comfortable with it. Okay. Klaus, any thoughts on the separate standard? Of course. Um, uh, as Arnold already mentioned before, uh, it's not an easy question. Um, I cannot clearly say yes, and I cannot uh, clearly say no. Um, so you're unsure? I, of course, of course. I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm unsure. If if I only got two options, A or B, I would uh, clearly uh, say a B, um, because um, I think um, um, it causes um, additional problems uh, with a separate standard. Uh, one problem is when will you have to use uh, the SME standard and when will you, you have to use a full set of uh, ISAs? Uh, we, uh, uh, you can um, um, use some exact definitions. What, what is a non-complex entity? What is an uh, SME uh, or, or whatever? But uh, coming from the, from the practice, we always find it's not that decisive. There are small companies uh, who are, which are very easy, uh, which have a, um, a business model which is easy to understand. Uh, but on, on only one um, point um, in the balance sheet, for example, maybe the, the stocks, it's somehow complicated. And uh, this you cannot solve with a, with a different uh, type uh, with a uh, different uh, set of standards uh, because you have to decide uh, do you have to apply the full set or only the um, uh, the SME set and um, I think scalability is much more 
uh, applicable uh, to, the, to, to this, and it's much much smarter to solve this uh, uh, this problem. A second point is uh, is a point for the profession. Talking uh, as a uh, representative of a small audit firm, if there comes a separate uh, set of standards, I do see the danger that uh, in the future um, uh, the smaller firms cannot um, perform any audits um, because um, the, the separate set of standards for SMEs might uh, become a so-called second-class standard and uh, especially from, from, from the lenders, from the banks or uh, whoever and uh, then they demand from their clients to have a full set um, ISA audit and uh, I do think this is, a, this is a problem but coming back to the questions to the question, I'm really not sure what is the right answer, I have to say. Jill? Yeah, I'm on the fence also. <laughs> um, because, I mean, Kai made some very good points, and obviously he and his colleagues have um, thought long and hard about the project that they embarked upon, and uh, they obviously put a lot more time and effort into thinking about what they wanted to achieve and how they could achieve it and what would be good and what would be great and what was good to have and what was vital to have. They, they, they obviously spent a lot more time thinking about it than I have. Um, so, so that was persuasive. Um, and also in France, um, they have a standard and they've obviously put a lot of effort thinking about it as well. Um, and again, more than I have. But I have to say, my sympathies do lie more with um, Klaus. Uh, all the points that, that, that he was, was making were, you know, closer to my gut feeling. And when I try and think about it, my head does hurt. Um, but, uh, you know, how, as Svetlana said, will we tie it to the ISIS? Would we separate it? Would it become stand in danger of be being a second-class standard, which then led to second-class auditors because they're the ones who habitually use that standard. You know, it could, there's all sorts of nightmare things, worst-case scenarios, obviously. And I, um, so, so I'm not sure. So I think I would need to think more. I think, I think the project that IWSB is embarking on to see what can be done is obviously a very valuable project because I think you can't just say at this point yeah a standalone standard's the way to go because there are far too many um, parameters and too many variables and too many considerations many of which aren't actually to do with the performance of any one individual audit but more to do with perceptions of what auditing is the profession what you know the 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 the, the professional quality of auditors who work in SMPs or who perform SME audits in larger firms. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's far too complex. Um, I mean, my, my preference to answer the next question <clears throat> is to rewrite all the standards. And I know it would take years, but I think, but the problem then is that, you know, you're letting the best be the enemy of the good. Um, so maybe, maybe a separate standard is the best achievable Solution, even if it's not actually the best solution, but I don't think hmm. I don't think we have enough. I don't think I think we need to think more about it. Well, well, we'll get on to that. Kai, you wanted to say anything? Yeah, the things that are being raised there are things that we also considered when we developed our own standard, whether it will be a second tier audit or not. But I think that's also will be based on how the standard then looks at the end, uh, whether or not do you get the same level of assurance. Um, is it linked to the ISIS or not? Um, I think that it should be somewhat linked to the ISIS based on the same principles and so on. Um, so uh, whether or not the separate standard, as you said, is the best solution or the most workable solution, mm. uh, yeah, that's because uh, yeah. uh, if you were to have standards that you could scale, uh, start from the baseline and then scale up and scale down, maybe the best solution. but. Mm. Is that achievable? It's a lot of work, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and is it even achievable? Where to consider all okay. the uh, complexity and so on? Okay. Well, it'd be interesting to, I think, now understand what the audience has said, which um, 
<laughs> Come on, we're waiting for. I think it's fair to say while the panel is speaking, people change their minds and the vote is changing, so you have influence there. So people go and oh, that's true. That. That's dynamic voting. It's. I mean. I suppose it's not, well, it's not conclusive at all. I mean, I know most of you, well, more of you have voted for, for yes, but uh, there is a still, you know, a large, significant, unsure majority. And we'll get on to the next question, you know, in a minute. Isabel, are you going to react to this? And I know we mentioned the standard of France. It should be on automatically, so... Okay. Yep. Uh, so, no, I, I did not want it to, co to comment on uh, the answer, but on the question. Because the question was just on small entities, and we have lost the less complex entity. Mm -hmm. And whenever we try to uh, use only the concept of small entity, it's a kind of dead end, because you start measuring how big is 4 million euro? Is it big, big, or big enough, or not big enough? And, uh, and, then, and then it's the end of the debate. Uh, so I would really prefer that we always attach the concept of non-complex or simple, and we had this very good saying in the conference in Paris where we were encouraged to think simple first, and that's really what we should do when we develop standards. But just small entity, that's... Uh, a small part of the problem, and uh, it's very difficult for the f for the people because when we speak of small entity, you mentioned 100 people working for an entity. For you, it's a small entity. In France, it's a big company if you have 100 people working <laughs> for the company. So um, if we could always, when we when we speak about this topic, attached non-complex to small, I think it makes it much easier to imagine what we could invent for our respective countries. I, I mean, I fully agree with that. I mean, that, that was, I mean, one of the reasons and I was involved with sort of sponsoring the Cogito paper and uh, one of the things that, you know, I push strongly is that we did have this SME and non-complex because I completely agree with you. You can have complex things in SMEs yeah. and they need complex auditing standards to deal with those. So um, we've got to get that balance somehow. And that is a difficult question. And uh, and so it is, it, is, it is a different area. Has anyone, Dan, your thoughts on this? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I get a little worried when, when I'm when I'm listening to the panel because you are talking about the risk for second class audit or second class standard. I, I think there is a bigger risk, uh, and that is that that uh, SME audit will remain at all, remain relevant, and and we have to do something and be proactive and and and, and really dare to do something, and we can't just wait. Uh, because we are losing uh, audit assignments every day as we speak here. So we can't just go on discussing. We have to do something. Thank you. And I think that it was a question I wrote down here about, um, because we're talking really about a market in some countries that, of course, audit is not required. And it is, you know, how do you justify an audit or, or what is, you know, what is the... Um, the principal reasons for um, an entity to have an audit. And I don't think we're always very clear about that. And I know Sona, you mentioned, you know, it's what the users needs, you know, whether that's suppliers of finance um, or whether it's, um, you know, shareholders who are not part of the business, which happens a lot in some of the SME, you know, environment as well. And I think, and I can understand, Dan, how what you were saying, that if, if we don't, you know, if we don't have a solution that's quick and we spend 10 years discussing this and talking this, and I think Catherine Bagshaw mentioned it as well, actually will, yes, you'll always have audit for the, the pies and, and, and um, the, the larger entities because it will be required by legislation, but will audit not, you know, be required? So, you know, there is a risk of that and that then, you, you know, you're going back to the reviews, the compilations. Any other thoughts on this from the room? John? Um, yes, just to pick up on, on what was said about the fact that you might not be able to, identity, uh, to identify which type of entity um, is applicable and which standard might be applicable. Um, firstly, can I say, Miles, you keep talking about SMEs, whereas the M isn't part of any of this uh, process. It's only the small ones from what I've heard. Um, but secondly, 
somebody referred earlier to the distinction between the flight manual for a Cessna and uh, that for a 787. And I would say if you don't know whether you're flying a Cessna or a 787, then you probably shouldn't be flying at all any aeroplane. <laughs> um, and the same applies to auditors and audit judgments. If you don't know whether parts of that entity are complex and you need to step up and add something, then you really haven't got the ability to exercise any of the judgments that auditors need anyway. Good point. Any card you want? <laughs> As you mentioned, there's Cessna. <laughs> yeah, but that's also more to point out to saying that uh, if you are then flying the simple one, why should you go through the the the, uh, the full manual to say what is relevant? And as pointed out earlier, uh, we're then asking all the SM. SME or less complex uh, auditors to to uh, do that each time they do their audit to judge what are relevant and not from a lot of requirements that not necessarily is requirement. So they're doing a lot of extra work for that. But it's having, in the end, I suppose it's having the experience to be auditing what you are um, being asked to audit. And as a you know, I audit listed companies, but I've been dealing a lot in the chemicals and pharmaceutical sectors. I would never go in near a bank. I wouldn't have a clue how to audit at a bank because that's, I'm not experienced in, in that. And I think it's, it can be relevant as well. You'd, probably would I be that good in auditing an SME? Well, sorry, a small entity. Sorry, John. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll keep on saying that. Um, firstly, Christian, and if you can pass the mic, that would be great. And then yeah, I'll go, he can hand it back to you. Thank you. Uh, I suppose my, my question goes a little bit because you, you, you seem to say that, that with the current standards, we need something else, we need something more tailored. I suppose my question is, with the developments in technology, will that be actually able to do the trick for you, either by using artificial intelligence or, or, or just something as simple as an electronic code or, or a set of standards? with the appropriate level of questions to begin with, would that allow you actually to do the tailoring you are asking for? And is it then back to the fact that maybe some of the auditors may not be familiar with the risk-based approach? And then it links actually to very much to a question that's on the poll. Why not have a series of questions at the start of each ISA you know, related to the subject of the audit, um, which gives you a bespoke version? So. Jill, you said you were, had been gelling up on technology. So. <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't remotely describe it as that. Um, but I think that you're making some very good points, uh, although they were wide-ranging. So, But what I particularly wanted to um, home in on was when you were saying about, you know, tailoring, because because there are there are many automated computery um, audit tools available, uh, some of which... Um, are promoted by professional bodies or, or regulators in particular jurisdictions, um, some of which are, are clearly the preferred choice um, for firms to use. And then there are the commercial ones, the ones that are that have a certain amount of ubiquity. Um, you know, I'm not going to name any names, but we all know the ones that are used in more than one country. Um, and and I'm not familiar with some of the tools, and I am familiar with some of them because our member firms use them. Um, and it seems to me that, uh, and Catherine made the point when she was doing her um, bit, hello Catherine, if you're still listening, um, she mentioned that, you know, smaller practices, SMPs, who probably are doing a lot of small audits and maybe medium-sized audits and maybe complex audits as well, uh, or less complex audits, um, they, they are very much if they want to use technology they're at the mercy of who provides the technology because they aren't going to be developing it for themselves so they are buying from whether it's whether it's a very well-known commercial supplier who has dealings all over the world or whether it's from the local institute they they are buying from someone and and they are therefore reliant on the someone to provide them with a tool which is always uh, up to date, which is um, complete, i.e. not missing bits it should have, um, which they have been properly trained on. 
and um, which is properly supported. And um, in my experience, sometimes these conditions, these preconditions for success aren't always, aren't always present, and sometimes they are, and it works really well. But when they're not, people are like, oh, my God, because I thought that the technology was going to solve everything, and suddenly I've got a problem, and it's because, in fact, some of their staff haven't been properly trained or there was an update that they didn't implement or they didn't understand or something changed and nobody told them. And there's always going to be a reason but having said that, um, you are right. Tools used properly can really help. They really can. You can tailor the circumstances at the outset. It, you, can, you can focus your, your risk assessment process. Um, yes, there's an element of checklistiness about it all. And there's the danger that people will not tick that which they should have ticked or not put not applicable where they should have. Um, but used properly, they can be really, they can be helpful. But I think it's the used properly that is that is a big issue. You know, is there a lot of these audit tools in Canada? Um, uh, you know, th there are tools, but I'm, I guess I'm. There's still requirements that you kind of got to use your professional judgment. Do they apply to me? Do they not apply to me? Or how do I apply it in in different circumstances? So I'm not sure that those tools. Um, really help with that. Um, they don't know, do but everything. I mean, people who believe yeah, they do everything are on a sticky wicket. And this is where, but, and this is you, where you, get, you, you get situations where you over-document, right? Because you don't want to miss anything, and so yeah. you... Yeah, or, or you under-document because you think you can just get away with not ticking anything on that bit of the program without realising that actually you do have to. That's why it's there. Um, but still... Okay. Jan, I know you had a burning question, so... And I can't get away from that tie. <laughs> I t I'll take it off. <laughs> now, one one thing uh, when we when we say it's all for only for small entities, actually, I think that the issues that that uh, practitioners have when auditing small entities, they also ha might have when small auditing, uh, auditing small of medium sized entities. So that's why I'm a bit worried about just thinking about small entities. Which comes back to the point also about complexity that, that Isabel was ranging. You know, that is that the real driver? Kai, were you, so are you holding your microphone to yeah, say something? Yeah, it was more to say that uh, I think the, it's complexity. That is uh, the way it should be designed based on and not size, because you will end up in discussion. But doesn't, have that same, doesn't it have the same problem? It's not only by... It's difficult to say what is complex and what is not. But yeah, that's also there. That there's more gray. There's more gray than than uh, black and white. I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, I want to move on now. I think to the last question, and and this is really on the basis that we and Jill mentioned this. You know, if um, to the extent that we do have one set of ices for everything, so do it on the basis that we've um, we've decided that having a separate auditing standard is, is not the right solution. So what is the best way, you know, of doing this? Is it, do we keep, you know, we do nothing? Do we keep with the current and just rely on guidance and everything like that? Or do we revise the ICES, you know, start again effectively? Um, or is there something else? So while that is happening, um, Klaus, I think I might start with you. And okay. we'll, we'll just come down the line then, it's probably the easiest. What your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, going through the answers, I think uh, this question is much easier than the others before because option A, nothing. Um, I don't think that anybody in this room is really thinking about this option uh, as we learned from, from Hilde already before, uh, stay at the status quo is not an option. Um, also, option B, I don't think it's a really good uh, option. There's already lots of guidance available. Um, and um, I don't think we need um, uh, additional, uh, additional guidance. Maybe in some points uh, uh, the guidance can be better structured and uh, to uh, um, but this is uh, also going to, to, to the more to the training uh, sections. Um, for me, option C, revise the ISS to, to apply a thing small first approach, um, is uh, is the option I would uh, I would choose. 
um, because this is um, this is what we are all talking about. Talking about um, the the auditors have the problem to to get the full set of of ISAs um, um, performed in practice, and, um, and and it needs to. Um, and I do think that they, it needs to be uh, revised uh, completely to to go think small first approach and um, add additional things for more complex um, uh, situations. Um, it would be much easier, um, um, uh, not only for um, for for small auditors, but for all auditors, because it's it's a more um, uh, this is this is a more natural uh, outcome. I uh, I uh, would like to say it is much easier to just to describe what is necessary in every circumstance and then go to specific uh, situations than vice versa as it is now. Yeah, and option D is a, uh, a quite an um, um, an open open space. Uh, um, we have found some thoughts in, 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 in the Cogito paper, but um, I do think we it's more coming to, uh, when we go back to question three. Should we go uh, with one uh, set of standards or uh, do we need to have two sets of standards? This is a very um, um, important uh, question and should be answered at one uh, point uh, and um, so I don't see really um, not too much other options at this stage. In, uh, to deal with scalability and proportionality as we revise and develop new standards. And we've seen some papers from the IAAs be thinking about that and the, 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 you know, the development of a framework, but that's still ongoing and <laughs> I don't think there's a framework out there. So I think the first step, and that's an easier solution than, um, than think small first uh, revision because that's gonna be quite comprehensive. Uh, I think we, I think the IAASB should identify the areas within the ISAs that are hard to scale and address them and deal with it. There's, you know, I'm sure we can accumulate um, a list of, of areas and so uh, more targeted to, to address those areas. And I think number three is, and this is something that we've been doing in Canada, is during the development of new uh, or revised standards, we need to make sure that we listen very carefully to practitioners in, in the small markets. The better we consider scalability and proportionality as we develop the standards, the more uh, fit there will be. And so in Canada, we've done uh, quite a bit of, um, we've put quite a bit of effort to you know, be innovative and, uh, and, and get the SMPs involved in standard setting and, and listen to them and, um, and identify what those issues are because the more informed we are, the better I think we can influence the IAASB. So um, that's my solution. It's not, you know, I, I think small first approach would be nice, but I mean, how realistic is this that, that, that all the ISAs, all 36 of them or how many of them are gonna be revised? Um, that's, that's, you know, we'll, we're not gonna be done in 20 years. So, um, so that's, that's, that's the view. <laughs> Jill, I think you've already answered the question, but well, uh, do you any? I did say that I would, in an ideal world, revise them from the bottom up, and I still would. Uh, although, in fact, after the interjection from our, our French colleague, I would say think simple first, not think small first, because you're absolutely right. It is the the issue is complexity. It's not size. It's what what needs more work and what doesn't. It's having derivatives. Mm -hmm. For example, it's having complicated estimates. That's when you need to be doing the more work, not if you're four million or five million. That's if you haven't got anything complicated going on inside. It doesn't matter whether you're four million or five million. What matters is, you know, the evidence that needs to be obtained. Um, so, in an ideal world, I'd go for that. It would take some time, 
it wouldn't take 20 years. It didn't take 20 years to, you know, so... But if it does, I don't care because I'll be retired by then. Um, so, so you can do that. Um, but I, I could also go for other, which would be to draw a line right now and say from now on, everything that comes out is going to be, this is the non-complex and there are more complex situations. Or if you're a PIE auditor, you're going to have to do this as well. So switch it around for everything new coming down the line, like the things that are going to be approved soon um <laughs> next week whatever it is yeah <laughs> just rewrite them now um but but that you know it's to actually to show willing to show willing to to actually address the issue that at the moment what we've got is here's the full picture scale it down yourselves guys rather say here's the basic picture and here's the extra stuff and then and then go through and rather than revising everything else just identifying what applies to complex and what applies to non-complex. That would be quicker. It wouldn't be ideal. It might even be quick and dirty, but, but it might get us somewhere where we actually had a clear understanding. Rather than saying, here's, here's everything with all the possible bits of tinsel we could put on it, and by the way, if you're small, you don't have to do some of these things. Say, so here's the bread and butter, and if you want to have jam or marmite or what else then then here are the extra bits on top and that that might make it more simple for people to read and be quicker so that would and, be a possibility and i think we've mentioned um this afternoon you know that this wouldn't potentially have to be all standards i mean applying materiality does that you know is that any different i yeah, mean really so it, you know may well be the same and, and we we talked about the risk ices being you know one of the areas and, and i know 540 you know so anyway and i think whether we can be innovative but kai i know this is probably a question that you think well why are we asking but uh, <laughs> no i think it's a question that's worthwhile asking because at the end of the day it's about how can you derive at the uh, relevant standards in each situation and if we could go with a situa with this situation, writing the general ISA and then adding things on with uh, issues coming in and uh, complexity. That could be very well. That could be very well the solution. But um, I think the question then also, uh, with what is going on in the different countries around the world today, can we allow uh, for that period of time of waiting and? Uh, not doing anything in the meantime, or do does something need to be done right away, uh, or sooner rather than later? Because um, as the Cogito paper points out as well, it, it's not only the complexity and or building block thinking simple first. It's also uh, the language uh, in the standard itself that it's complicated language with uh, started out uh, after we have the revised ISAs and then as things have been added on that there are difficult to navigate around in the ISA as well. So I think it's more than just the building block that are in the issues right now. So Okay. Can we see the results? Is it C? <laughs> It'd be so quite a few of you have voted for other and um I would be very interested in getting, you know, thoughts of who did vote for other and, and why they voted for other. I mean, you might have voted for other because, of course, you feel you you want a standalone standard, so that might have been the reason you voted for other. Um, is anyone willing to, uh, you know, speak up and say why they voted for other and what their thoughts are on other? Sorry, it was just it, exactly the one that I think Lana uh, mentioned, which is, it was uh, the fact of small. It was the, purely to think non-complex. That was the the issue. Uh, that's why I, I said other because I think the think small is not necessarily the right concept. Okay. But I think it's very clear that the you know it's not the solution. To develop guidance, and, and I think we've probably heard that you know through here. Is there any other thought? Uh, Arnold, I don't know whether you want to 
I mean, maybe I will come back to you at the end, but but do um, just to get you know any thoughts from what you've heard today. So I'll, I'll warn you now. But if there is anything you want to say um, at any time, please please let me know. Is there? I mean, is there any other thoughts on on this? On um, you know, was anybody surprised? I suppose from what we've heard, probably this isn't a unsurprising you know, result. Any other thoughts in relation to this? Dan. Dan. Okay. <laughs> Sorry for being so pushy, but but uh, I, I was voting for other because if we don't come up with a new separate standard for an SME audit, uh, I think it was Jill who said that IAASB has earned the right to innovate. I didn't say that. Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, okay. Yeah, it, it could have been you, <laughs> but it wasn't. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. well. Actually, I used to work for them a long time ago, but I don't actually believe they haven't that right necessarily but yeah but i think it must be said when, when we meet here today that there is a need for doing some proactive with regard to to new technology because we we see now that real-time reporting becomes reality in sweden so there is uh, I think there is a, a, a need for real-time audit mm. in yeah. in near-time future. So, so that's where I think that there is uh, a need for some innovative uh, measures. Mm. Thank you. But is that? I mean, that's not just I suppose for the small entities. That's you know across the whole yeah. the whole board. And and um, you know I'm quite heavily involved with the way we use data analytics and our orders. And I was saying, I think I mentioned, you know, I believe actually it is easier to use data analytics in a small audit because they have less complex ERP systems. It is easier probably, they have less complex, let's say the way they journal, they do journal entry structures and a lot of it is, is built on using journal entries. That actually, you know, isn't that the way we should be looking at this of, of using more the technology in the audit, which would make it more potentially value add because you can, you know, talk to the, the owners of the company in a, in, in a much more way of, what is happening into their entries and 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 being bolder and saying you know I'm going to uh, make sure that no one's being fraudulent in your company, um, but also um, it you know it will so it will show more the value of the audit, but also using the technology will drive down you know hopefully reduce you know the cost and make it easier to do. But that's just my personal opinion. Christian, um, yes. can we have a mic for Christian? Yes, I, I was a little bit stimulated by, by a, a question by Paul Thompson about whether we're reasonable and certain about um, what the SMEs need. And I suppose that the provocative question is, if it's not a complex business, would they need an audit? Or are, are, are the services sufficient? Does anyone want to pick this one up? But, I mean, Svetlana, I'm going to pick on you, I'm afraid, because I know in Canada you said, well, you know, there are still a lot of re reviews and, and maybe that is sufficient for them. And uh, I mean, exactly it. And it's not about the complexity of the, of the entity um, or the size of it. It's really just what do the users need? And... Um, as I said, some 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 um, some entities don't have external users. They just don't. And management needs a set of financial statements for their own purposes. And do they really need an audit? Um, others, banks, like you know, I think our statistics show that 50% of our SMEs get um, have um, um, you know have uh, have loans, and so there is then external users, but. They're okay with reviews and compilations because they have access to further information if they need. So again, it's it's really about users um, and um, worked well for us. What about the tax man? There's been the I, mean, I know one country has, and I um, I think it's this is in Sweden with the the National Audit Office who came out with a report who said that actually the value of an audit they would be that when they took away the audit, the tax take from those companies dropped. And um, so that's one of the reasons why they're putting back an audit. And, and the, well, that's what, I think it was sort of... No, um, no changes in the report. All right, no changes in, in, in all right, okay. 
Sorry, I got that wrong. But I mean, the number studies saying that they actually had a positive impact on employment overall. All right. Okay. But there is the. I mean, you know, in the end, some of this gets back to actually saying what is the value of an audit. Why should companies have an audit? And <coughs> the easier we can make it to provide that audit. And so, and it probably comes back down to the to the cost. Um, will help in that situation, which I think is what really was driving a lot of the work that was done in the Nordic region. I think also it's that uh, we're almost like uh, in the intersection saying, do we believe that audit can be valuable for audits of small or less complex entities? Because uh, today there are uh, requirements to have audits of small entities in a lot of countries, but do we as professionals say we no longer believe in audit ourselves to those entities? Is that the question we should be asking? Or should we say how can we deliver audit in the best possible way so that it gives value also for the users of the financial statements and owners and so on for the small and non-complex entities? I'm just Going through some of the questions on here, which um, you know that are on, the, and some of them are on on the um, on the slides there. I think one of the coming back to the separate standard is, of course, how that you know how you work, how that works in the profession. And Klaus, maybe I can come to you because I know you were very you know against this is to the extent that you know if you did have a separate standard and you you know one day you're you're you know, you're auditing a listed entity and the next day you're auditing a, a company that's using the separate standard that can't be easy yeah of course um, I do think uh, there is um, um, there will be a tendency that there will be different levels of, uh, of, of assurance um, if it is not then I question uh, why you have uh, a separate standard. Um, if, then, if it's it's the same level of assurance and, and it's it's based on the on the ISAs, uh, then it's it's just a different um, kind of yeah you know, compilation of of of, of the ISAs uh, um, uh, for for special um, for special uh, for for the, for the non complex world. And um, I'm not really, uh, I'm not really sure if this, uh, if this uh, uh, works. Uh, it's it's a difficult question, and I wonder if uh, the market will will um, accept um, another uh, uh, level of assurance. We already mentioned um, we have compilation uh, review and audit, and um, another the fourth dimension. Um, I don't think it's uh, really, really um, valuable. So, though if you think about it now with accounting standards, we do, you know, we have separate sets of accounting standards. We have I4S, we have I4S for SMEs. So the market is able to accept different accounting standards. Should that be any different for auditing? From my perspective, uh, I, I I don't think that the IRFS for SME, SMEs is uh, is very successful. Yeah, um, I I really know nobody who's really um, working with uh, with uh, with this. Uh, in in uh, what I learned, what when, when uh, in from from my experience, when uh, clients want to have want to change to IRFS. They uh, go for the full sets of IFRS and nothing else. Okay. Any other questions from the from the floor? I just there's one. There is one question that I want to answer that actually no one has answered, but I'm I'm going to answer it. I'm going to ask it, and, and of course we can't ignore that we've got the monitoring group consultation going on and um, we don't you know yes that we don't know where that outcome but that may well drive the position but it could one of the outcomes could be a position where we do have two standard setting boards the one that deals with P 
PIEs and then one that deals with, with non PAs. That is a is a possibility, which of course is the position we currently have that the US currently has. And I suppose I'm just really wanting, you know, to get the views of the panel whether they think that is a, a desirable outcome or not. And Jill Sorry, as I'm just say that again. <laughs> Do you think that is that one of the results of this consultation that the monitoring group are doing could be having two standard setting boards, yeah. one for PIEs, one for non PIEs. Do you think that is a good thing or not? Um, it's not what I would have wanted to see. Uh, uh, it's not what I would have voted for had there been some kind of referendum. But I have a habit of being on the wrong side in referendum, so you know. Um, I voted we'll out as another, well. So uh, in. Way <laughs> <laughs> for me. I voted. I voted no, in. No, I in, voted in. Yes, no. obviously we're here, aren't we? Um, so you know, I'm not a very good bellwether. Uh, if it is what's happening, if it is what ends up happening, we will have to live with it, and. It seems to me that if that does happen, it is an opportunity to 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 say, okay, IWSB owns the ICES and IWSB is not writing standards for um, PIEs anymore. Then let's write the best standards we possibly can for for non PIEs and make sure that 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 we think non complex first. So I think that there would be a way to get a good to get good consequences out of the situation if that is how it ends up it's not a situation I wanted Svetlana any views on this? Um, I mean no I don't I don't think it's a good idea um, you know for and, and again it's the same reasons to you you're gonna have what two separate standards and all the deficiencies that come with that so um, so okay Klaus any views? Just quickly, um, the great success of ISOs is that they are world, world, worldwide accepted for all, um, not only for all countries, but, but all, for all sizes of uh, companies. And um, I think we should stay with this. This is a big success. And if we split it into worlds, uh, these will be different worlds. Yeah, on that I agree that the, the, a global solution on this issue needs to be had. Uh, um, but we need to find what that glo best global solution is, whether or not it's to rewrite all the standards or have a separate standard for audits of SMEs. Uh, I think the consultation that will be coming up from uh, IWSP will get some input on that as well. So. Uh, and I'm, I mean, I fully. I, I mean, I do not believe we should. We should have one standard setting board. It should be global, and it should deal with everything. Is just my personal view here. But uh, Arnold, can I just ask whether there are any comments or any thoughts that you got out of the discussion? Um, was there anything that scared you? <laughs> was there anything? It, it, and I suppose for you to be on TV. Because um, actually, <laughs> maybe we should have warned everybody that there, this has been streamed live. So, yeah. <laughs> but no, I think he's up there. So you should be there, fine. Yeah. No, fine. Um, first of all, I'm not scared. Um, when I entered the room, Edelfried said to me, "You look as if you're on holiday," which is true. Uh, and certainly, an afternoon like this is complete holiday, meaning relaxing, with good company, a great conversation. So, what else would I like more? And. I'm very serious on that. Um, just a couple of pickups. Um, and actually, tomorrow morning, we have my executive steering committee in London, and I will report some of this already to them. Um, first, don't worry too much on the monitoring group for the moment. Um, we met with them a couple of weeks ago, and um, they themselves said it's likely by the end of the year or so there will be a second consultation and they first have to discuss all kinds of further complex issues like funding, etc. But the idea of the board split, as you mentioned, Miles, is not in their consultation. They have a question, should there be one board auditing plus ethics or two? This one is not there. 
Um, so let's keep an open mind, but in the meantime, do what we can do. And um, I'm very pleased, of course, with the support for the ISAs that I'm hearing. Um, the current count is 128 jurisdictions that have adopted uh, the ISAs. Every big jurisdiction being there, but many smaller ones as well and across the globe, so that's great. Um, first of all, my sincere thanks to Accountancy Europe of, of having this uh, conversation and, and the Cogito document. I think it's very timely, also given the discussions that we hopefully will have in the board in uh, September. And I trust that you will have a summary sent to the IWSB, copy to CHI, that you can make sure that it's part of the working group deliberations. Um, it's really great input. And, and I pick up a couple of those. Um, Catherine indeed started with um, the IWSB might be entitled to experiment and innovate it. And I forget what Jill said about it. Um, I thought it was a nice comment. And sometimes people have to say that to you. Well, look, you're there and people have accepted. And sometimes it's time to have a very open box approach. And I take that one with me. Maybe that's one of the other elements that we said. Well, take kind of a fresh start. What would an audit be in a not too complex situation nowadays, looking forward also with the technology that is coming up? That, that's a great question. And it's just my personal reactions for the moment, but I was encouraged by that comment, so let's keep that in mind. Um, another interesting discussion was on the documentation overload. And here really one of the, the questions is, is that indeed because of the requirements in the standards? Or is it the understanding of the standards, whereas we maybe didn't intend it to be? Or is it the regulators that are imposing that? Or is it perceptions of what regulators might be imposing? So I could much agree with Jan Thijs. We need to talk together all the time, and certainly also with regulators. I'm not mentioning that educating, but let's face this. Is there a risk of an overload of documentation just because of perceptions or because of the wrong requirements or whatever? I'm not yet convinced that it's in the standards, but I, I see the reality of this big issue. Um, I think there was this interesting suggestion. I think Graham came from you. Um, you're Graham Corden, eh? Yeah. Um, sure, would it be helpful if there would be questions in the beginning of each ISA? And when I read the question, I thought, well, that's just a good example of a helpful question. Whether that's helpful or not, you can further discuss it, but it's an illustration of how helpful a conversation like this is, including the spontaneous questions that you can put and therefore part of the feedback document might be also just a listing of these questions. That's just helpful. So thanks for doing that. Um, the implementation support that you mentioned, Svetlana, is also a very important one. You will see questions in the strategy. How much time should we spend, we and or others, like national standard setters, on doing more on implementation support? We, we get a lot of that feedback. Don't spend too much time on new standards or revised standards, for example, for data analytics or for emerging external reporting, but focus on practical guidance and application. So that's a kind of strategic question. How should we spend our time? And therefore, that part of the com conversation and your comments were quite helpful as well. Um, and is the risk-based model maybe not really understood coming from a more substantive procedures approach? It's a very good question as well. So then I'm looking at our current agenda because we had this suggestion, stop now, and, and, um, and I thought, well, let's stop after something. <laughs> because we... 540, <laughs> hopefully, out in June of... Well, PIUB approval in September, but as a final standard. Um, but then, very important exposure drafts, uh, hopefully agreeing on 315 in um, June as well. There's a clear link, of course, between 540 and 315. But also the quality control, quality management standards, uh, September and December, coming out as an ED. Now, an exposure draft phase is very interesting because that's precisely the moment that you can come in with a lot of helpful comments. Well, this doesn't work, that may work, that's great, exactly. So I would rather say have a lot of feedback, also organized feedback, when we have published uh, these documents, hopefully. It's still a lot of work to do. But Now, on 540, um, because that was a point that you made, Klaus, um, 
why not special considerations for listed entities? Um, it's, another, it's, it's a great comment. And why always starting on the SME side and not on the listed side? Um, actually, if you see 540, I could claim, at least for the sake of argument, that it's doing that a little bit. And the history is interesting. When we had the exposure draft, we proposed a very clear think simple first approach by saying, well, if the risk assessment analysis of inherent risk results in low, then take a very simple approach, and it's one of three testing strategies uh, that would not be complex at all. And then the world came back to us and said, well, that's a great idea, but there's always a big but. What if it's not just low, but a little bit more than just low? Could we still go, etc.? So we've changed that. We've not taken away the concept in a way, but we've said, well, it might be more helpful to have a spectrum of risk approach. Your ju professional judgment would have to tell you where you are on the spectrum, which ranges from very low inherent risk to very high. And we cannot define where you will end up. It's your judgment. It's still a lot of judgment based. But depending on how you arrive at that spectrum, you can choose a testing strategy, one or more, including a very simple one. Uh, if you have time, just wait what happens after balance sheet date, for example, for loan loss impairments. So it starts, started with things simple first, then people are saying, well, but if it's a little bit more complex than just simple, well then, and that's part of this discussion, I fully agree, we fully agree, um, it's not things small, it's things simple, but still then. Where does simple end? Well, that's okay, but where does it start? And what if it's changing all of a sudden? If one of your clients makes life a bit more complicated, which part of the standards are you in? So these are really very important discussions, the very heart of the current standards development. And therefore, uh, the feedback that we will be getting um, is, is, is very important. It's very essential. Another comment, I think Svetlana made that as well, and you illustrated also, listen very carefully to small practitioners. Uh, in my ranking of the first question, I think, have we spent enough time understanding, let's say, the, the, the simple environments, or the SME or whatever? And that's, of course, not really the case. It's not how it goes. You draft standards, you think what's working best, you take into account everything that you can think of, but it's not something like focused on SMEs and say, well, what exactly is this and how should we address that? It's part of the whole. So in this context that we are now discussing for this project, we certainly should take that to heart again. And it's what I said in the beginning, we may need your help a lot, but it's a very important reality. Um, my answer in the last question was also in the other area. Um, and that's basically because of two things. The one is the element of innovation, experimenting that I mentioned. The other, of course, is technology. Um, we haven't thought hard enough, we couldn't so far, about how could we use technology in all of this. I'm very convinced that there's a lot of possibilities for applying technologies also in an SME, SMP, a simple environment. So it should be a very important part of that work as well. So just a few personal reflections. I'm really grateful for, for the whole afternoon that you have been willing to spend your time to stay here. Um, don't stop doing that. I saw some positive responses to responding on the online strategy. And really, that, that could be very helpful if you get a lot of strong voices at this stage to this very open-minded consultation. So please do. And once more, thank you very much. Thank you. I would also just like to um, echo my um, the thanks to all the panelists, to the speakers, um, and to all you in the audience for your active participation. And I apologise for picking on some of you, um, but uh, then. And also, I'd like to thank all, of course, the, the hard work that was put into organizing this event. And I know that um, Naomi now and Julie will be able to sleep well tonight after such a, the way it worked and that, um, that there was no glitches. And, and thank you also, Catherine, for um, linking in remotely. And I'm, I just didn't think it worked for us to go back to Catherine. So um, I apologize, Catherine, to you and uh, for, for that. And um, last but not least, you will be getting an email soon asking you for your feedback on the event. So please do 
um, respond to that. It will be useful to know whether you feel this is useful or um, you know what your thoughts are on on the event. So please respond respond to that. And there is some drinks, I think, outside. So thank you all. Safe journeys home. Um, and uh, this is something, an area that I'm sure we're going to be debating um, all through this this year. And it is a very important area. And and, and I suppose <laughs> the one thing I would I would would say is I do believe we need a global solution, and I think the IWSB needs to drive this forward. So hopefully, Arnold, that's the way we can go. So thanks, everybody. Safe journeys home, and um, have a good evening. <laughs>